Is it live stream on? It says live. Is it live stream on? Yo, it is. Nice, nice. It says live. Nice, nice. Uh, oops. I'll let the nerds come in. Yep. All right, we're live. Nice. Good to see. You. Time to time to shill my live stream on Twitch. I mean, not Twitch on Twitter. Live stream on Discord. Discuck. Here we go. Classic live stream. Now nah, we're on. Time to. We got three viewers already. Oh, two. Nice. Two viewers already. That's like, that's pretty cool. So while the people are getting into the stream, I'll just talk about some bullshit and then we get some questions. The Q&A will be pretty much going on like throughout the whole live stream. So this, this live stream can last for like 30 minutes or it will be an hour or two hours. It's really dependent on the amount of people that ask these questions. Oh, nice. Nick shills me on the dire cord. That's pretty good to see. So just to repeat, we'll take questions. You can ask any questions you have in a live chat. Um, and I have some couple of stuff to talk about. As it says on the, in the title, this is going to be a free talk. It's going to subscribe to celebration party. So before I even begin, I mean, I'd like to thank all subscribers so far, everyone that has checked my videos out at one point or another, it's, uh, I think th we, we started this channel less than, I think two months ago, less than two months ago, and we already have 500 subscribers, so it's pretty cool, it's, it's I'm pretty honored to see uh, people liking my content, Decrepitude says congrats brother, yeah I really appreciate it man, and We'll, we'll put out more content, we'll put out more theology, more, I guess, uh, pol political related stuff as well. They're going to be coming soon. And we'll see, we'll see. 10 viewers already, okay, that's pretty good. Uh, the first thing I'd like to talk be before people like chime in their questions, and, and I would like to repeat myself. If you have any questions, you can ask them anytime, and I'll just answer them, n not instantaneously, but I'll answer them immediately as I possibly can so you can just ask any any questions you have in your mind and I guess the first thing that's on my mind is probably the Joker movie uh, as you can see in the thumbnail what's up oh hey Anastasios this guy's a good friend of mine I'm good how are you bro I check I sent you a message on Twitter you should check your Twitter DMs by the way um, the first thing is the Joker movie and I I, I made a Twitter post about it couple days ago but I pretty much think Joker movie is gonna be or Black Panther uh, the fact that so many people are already crying about it before the movie even came out to me it's very strange <laughs> it's very strange that there are people that already complain about the movie it's, it's not even out dude what are you so scared about but another thing that's very interesting is that uh, they showed it in a film festival, and there are a lot of people that only rated the movie. So amongst men, amongst the male population, 95% um, of them like the movie, right? They're like, there's a they, the movie got a 95% rating by men. And then you check the woman, and they, it, it only got 65% rating by women. So right off the bat, just by that statistic alone, I can say that this movie is going to be a really good one. Uh, and jokes aside... I think the reason why people are like, I guess, scared of the movie is it's it's not going to be the typical cape shit movie, right? Most cape shit movies are pretty standard. You either have an origin story or you have a bunch of heroes working together as a team. Those are like the only like the only two cape shit movies that you end up seeing. And uh, Joker's it's it's an origin movie, but it's going to be pretty different. It's going to be much more dark. I, I think that it's going to be a lot more realistic. It's going to have a commentary 
as much as a meme we live in a society is, it is going to be a commentary, a criticism of society in a way, as, as memeish as that sounds. So I'm pretty excited for that. And if the movie turns out to be interesting, I'll probably do a video about it as a, as a small anal analysis of it. So I'm pretty excited of, about the Joker movie. Um, I think it's going to be a really good movie. I think it's going to be great day Kino, but it might be disappointing. There's also like a leaked scene uh, of the movie. I'm not going to really spoil it now. I did check the leaked scene out, but I'm not going to spoil it just yet. But it's like from that leaked scene itself, it is pretty, uh, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, Alex Popovich. Yeah, what was the deal with the leaks? They got deleted before. So yeah, they're getting deleted all over the place because obviously they... The people that make the movie, they don't want these leaks to be out. Naturally, that's pretty obvious. So instead, uh, they're, they're deleting a lot of them. But, you know, you can never delete something off the internet. There's still going to be some people posting it around. And there are going to be some people that's going to be checking these leaks out. And those people checking the leaks out are going to be downloading it. And then they're going to post it again. That's just what's going to happen. So far, I think there's going to... there's Now, I don't like Reddit at all. Uh, you, you actually stay away from Reddit, but I did I did see some leaks from certain subreddits, and they still keep those they still keep those up, and uh, and as far as I know, there's only like one scene that's leaked. Uh, I might be wrong. There might be a lot more scenes that got leaked. I know there have been behind the scenes leakage, but they're not they're not anything significant. But nothing really much that's leaked. And I mean, obviously, the fact that it got an award from the Venice Film Festival is also pretty wild. I mean, I guess it's, it's to be expected. It is a very ambitious movie. And as I said, we're going to see what's, uh, what's going to come out. I think uh, there are some people, I don't agree with the sentiment, but there are some people that are worried about the movie. They think that it's going to be used as a false flag against single pimp people, against incels and whatnot. I don't think that's going to happen. Some people think that you know, when the movie premieres, just like the Dark, Dark Knight movie, they're going to have... Uh, someone's going to shoot up a movie theater or something. I don't think that's going to happen. I, I doubt that's going to happen. But there are some people that, that are worried. It might happen, but I think there's like a 5% chance of it happening. But um, outside of that, yeah, that's pretty much everything that comes to my mind about the Joker movie. And I did get a question from the 500 subscriber, subscriber goal. And that was like the only question I got. So, as I said, if you guys want some questions, feel free to ask them now because uh, it's been like eight minutes, and I guess people don't really have any questions. They just want me to. They just want to see me talk. That's fine. I have a lot of bullshit to talk about. But I did get a question from I don't remember the name. Um, I'm not gonna check it out now. But he asked. Uh, oh, he asked whether I'm baptized or I'm cradle dogs. Um, I am a convert. Yeah, I'm. I've been. I I guess I've been interested in slash. I, I've been interested in orthodoxy for like a while now. I think two years or more than two years. So I'm still very much a noob. Don't think of me as a spiritual guru, or like a theological mastermind. I, people don't think of me as such. But don't think of me like as if I'm some big dude. Um, I've been interested in orthodoxy for two years and. I really started going, the first time I went to church was like one and a half years ago in the U.S. So, yeah, I am a, I am a recent convert. And my catechumen, like my catechumen process, I think it lasted like a year, which I'm pretty thankful for. A lot of, these days, most, uh, most people end up being catechumens for a short time. My catechumen could have been for a short time, but in my case... Uh, due to, so I, I wanted to be baptized very quickly, but um, I couldn't. The, the, the priest agreed with ba me, uh, baptizing me fairly quickly as well. And uh, I'm glad that my catechumen lasted for a long time because you do learn a lot. Like, I don't think, at average, I think in, into the, in the age of today, I think you should be a catechumen for a year. On average right some people can do it very quickly some people can take uh, some people have a hard time so they need to be catechumen for a long time but in average I think it should be one it used to be between a year and three years so if I lived in the fourth century 
I still could have been just a catechumen, right? Decrepitude asks, what should we read so that we can gather the knowledge that you have? Your videos are filled with theological terms and such, so I'm just curious. In my case, this might come as a surprise, but in my case, I don't actually read that much. I do read articles, but I haven't read that many books. Um, in terms of in terms of what we need to read, I mean, obviously Jay's content, Jay Dyer's content is pretty good. Um, but if you but there are a lot of articles that he puts out, and the issue with like it's hard to follow that. Right, it's hard to understand. Okay, which one of these articles are like the basic bitch beginner articles, and which one of these articles are, uh, you know, advanced stuff? And I will, I will say, I'll even link it here. Uh, Jay's uh, video on ter uh, terminology, orthodox terminology. Let me just find it here. It's pretty helpful because if you're going to look up, like for example, something like essence energies distinction or anything that Jay talks about. You do need to understand the terminology, right? When I first <laughs> was trying to read uh, Orthodox articles in regards to theology, I will see terms like hypostasis. I will see like a bunch of heresies, like Manichaeanism or uh, Nestorianism, and I'd be like, "What the heck are those? Like, what do they even mean?" So I found it here. Yeah. So this itself is pretty helpful in terms of um, articles to check out. Uh, I can't really find much on the top off the top of my head, but I can say this: if you want to learn about Christology, one of the first books that I think you should be checking out is Father McCuckin's book on uh, what was it, Saint Kirill and the Christological Controversy. Let me see. Let me see the name of the book. I'll post it here as well. Yeah, Saint Kirill of Alexandria and the Christological Controversy. That's one of the I think. If you want to get into Christology, that will be one of the first books that you should be checking out. Um, it's not, it's not too basic level, but it is basic enough for you to, you know, understand what's going on. Alex Pafosh, like the Babylon B article, man knows he's deep into a theological argument because spell checks stop. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, that is that is very true. There's a lot of foreign terminology that you do have. Like that's the first thing that you need to check out. I will hundred percent say that. Like you need to check that out first, and then you can check. Yeah, then you can go into other stuff. I'd say my um, garden. Okay, tell me to shut up and ask too many questions. Oh, you know you can ask as many as you can, and I'll I'll try to answer them. But um. What was I saying? I forgot what I where, where I was going. Oh yeah, well my YouTube channel, I try to take I try to keep things simple, right? I, simplicity in argumentation is one of the one of the things that I'm trying to go for in my YouTube channel. For example, with regards to the essence energy distinction, it's just seven minutes. I will say it's very simple. It's a very simple argumentation that I'm trying to go for in in that video, and. I don't try to go too detailed, of course. If I'm of the firm opinion that um, if you're going to be arguing about something, you should keep it as simple as possible so people can understand it. Absolute human simplicity in argumentation. Yes, <laughs> pretty much. Garden asks, how do our prayers and prayer requests reach saints in heaven? Jesus is the only intercessor, intercessor between man and God, right? Are we praying to Jesus to make a request a to the saint? No, when it, when it, uh, Jesus is the only intercessor between man and the Father, right? So that's why we don't, when we're pr doing prayers, we pray, we don't directly pray to the Father, we pray to Jesus because any prayers that we go to, uh, make for Jesus, any petition we make for Christ, the Word of God, that petition goes out to the Father as well. So that's why uh, St. Paul says that Jesus is the only intercessor between man and God because when we pray to Jesus, and we, we know Jesus as a person, right? Not only as a character in the Bible, but as, a, as an actual human being, as, a, as an actual person in the Bible, but also as someone uh, that is, in a way, the bridge between the Father and mankind. Is my refrigerator running? Probably, but are you referring to the background sound? I'll, I'll lower the mic volume if that's the case. But uh, in terms of the saints, and prayers to the saints, I will say when you are asking 
prayers for the saints, it's no different than asking intercession from other other people, right? So we see in the Old Testament, I, I even made a Twitter post about this. When we look at Numbers, I believe, 14, uh, where Moses intercedes for Israel, that is an example of intercessory prayer. So Moses, by praying for Israel, God said uh, at the beginning of Numbers chapter 14, God says that... Um, Oh, God says to Moses that, oh, you know, I don't like I don't like these people. Um, I'm going to get rid of them, and I'm going to make you, uh, you know, I'm going to make new people from your seed. And then he prays, no, don't do such a thing. Change, you know, I, I'm sorry for the for the for my people's transgressions. Uh, please, be, please give grant mercy to them, etc., etc. And yeah. You be, if your refrigerator is running, you better go catch it. Ah ha ha! Very great. Um, Anastasia says, "I thought of it a little differently. In Jesus, human nature and divine nature meet. So Christ is immediately. I mean, that's one aspect of it. Yes, that is one aspect of it. Uh, and I think that's one of the crucial aspects of it. So yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Garden, how will the saint hear that prayer though? That's what I'm stuck on. People in heaven have the power to read our minds." Uh, I, I suppose, I don't, this is one of the questions, don't quote me on this, I might be wrong on this, I will say maybe, probably, but when we're making prayers, usually there's this, the this standard is not to make it, you know, when you're praying, you don't pray loudly so that every, your neighbor hears your prayer, but pray it, like, don't just keep it in your mind, basically. Um, I think, yeah, because it kind of makes sense. Because in terms of uh, some lives of the saints, in some of their lives, we can see that certain saints do have uh, certain, not abilities, but certain things that they can do that other human beings can't. So certain saints can indeed, quote unquote, read your mind. When, like, these, and I'm talking about these people that are living. So there are some stories about that. So I guess, yeah, that won't be too. And as St. Maximus the Confessor says in Atalassium, yeah, uh, we become everything that God has. We become the same. But except Christ became God by nature, by essence. We not became, but he is God by nature, whereas we uh, became, become divine by grace, right? So, uh, we, uh, yeah, as Anastasia says, what God is by nature, we become by grace. So, yes, saints called, not, I'm leaning 90% towards that saints called, yeah, in, in the reader minds. Kevin Sorrell asks, what do you do for a living and where are you from? Where are you from? That's what, that's a, like, that's what the questions that require a long answer, I guess, in my case, because it's kind of complicated. What do I do for a living? Well, I'm a student right now, so I do go to university. I used to work at a, as a tutor for a, uni for a university I went to for a year in the U.S. So I used to be a tutor for a year. And now I don't really have a job yet, and um, I'm still a, I'm still a university student. So what I do I have a lot of free time. Decrepitude asks, how does the church hierarchy goes? Is the patriarch the highest position? Does it work as a universal jurisdiction over a certain church? In example, patriarch Daniel over the Romanian Orthodox Church. Well, to put it simply, uh, the patriarch is yes, in a way they're the highest position, but at the same time, the patriarch is not the highest position. <laughs> so the patriarch is the highest position in the sense that he is representing a, a patriarchal seat, uh, but he is also as much as a bishop as Bishop X or Bishop Y, right? So Patriarch Daniel is just as much of a, a bishop as another Romanian bishop uh, that is under him, right? So they're both bishops, uh, but the patriarch doesn't have uh, a universal jurisdiction over a certain church. Universal jurisdiction over a certain church, that kind of sounds weird, but from what I understand, you're asking if that patriarch can do, if he can do anything he wants. Well, he can't really do anything he wants in that jurisdiction. He's a representative of that jurisdiction, but he is dependent of the bishops that they are under him, right? So, I will say that uh, it's coincider. 
it's con it's it's considered so we don't have the roman catholic view where like you know the patriarchs are not mini popes uh if you if you didn't like my explanation kind of you can ask uh in uh for clarification i suppose alexandros asks uh congrats on 500 subscribers thank you what makes a council ecumenical i made a video about this uh it's uh about reception theory it's about receptionism I won't tell you to check it out. I will answer the question for you. So I will say that I will go out on a limb and say that the ecumenical councils, so the first ecumenical council, second ecumenical council, you know, like Nikaya, Constantinople, those councils are just as dogmatic as the Hesychast councils, right? So they will be just as dogmatic. They will, they are they are dogmatic on the same level. I will argue because both. Because both the ecumenical councils and the, and the Hesychast synods or several other synods that weren't declared as quote-unquote ecumenical are just as dogmatic because they were received by the church. Now, this might sound kind of weird for some people, you know, received by the church. What does that mean? Well, every single apostolic Christian would agree that their own church is infallible, right? So if their church teaches something that's never going to be wrong and uh, the church teaching something doesn't equal to a certain bishop teaching something right so if so for example nestorius used to preach that uh, mary uh, that the theotokos that the virgin mary was not the mother of god that doesn't mean that the church preached that the that mary was not the mother of god right because it's just one bishop doing that but the church as a whole accepting a council makes that council a dogmatic teaching in a way <clears throat> And so I will. So uh, the church receiving that council and uh, teaching the teachings of that council, that's what makes the council dogmatic. That's what makes the council quote unquote ecumenical. And the ecumenical councils, there are, there are other ecumenical councils that are not part of the ecumenical councils. And there are other ecumenical councils, like the fifth council was not initially declared as an ecumenical council. Uh, the Pope didn't, the, the Pope even, he said, this is not an ecumenical council. He didn't even agree with the council at, uh, at the beginning. But then later on, St. Justinian managed to convince the Pope where he said, okay, you know, this is a, I do recognize this as a council, right? An ecumenical council, ecumenical means um, itself, ecumenical is based on the empire, right? So when you so we don't have the empire anymore, so naturally we don't have quote unquote ecumenical councils anymore. But as I said, uh, uh, Alexander. So basically, my pentarchy. I, I checked the other questions out, so I'll answer them. No worries. No, 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 no. It's not the pentarchy. We don't have this view where the five patriarchs are our version of the pope. We don't believe in that either. No. Um, no, I don't think any Orthodox teaches that. I think that's that argument is only like only Roman Catholics make that argument, from my knowledge. So, no, there, it's the Pentarchy is not even like a church doctrine or anything. It's not even like a uh, like something that declares what is ecumenical or not. As I said, the entire church accepting a council makes that makes that council dogmatic, right? And if a council declares something and the church teaches that something, then it's dogmatic, right? So, Richard asks, my wife and I are interested in attending an Orthodox church. Should we sh just show up to a liturgy or call the priest first? You can call the priest, but if you can't, you can always go to the liturgy. Always. And no one's going to... Like, I, when I, when I, before I became Orthodox, I had this kind of weird thing in my mind where I like, I'm going to walk into a church, but then there's going to be like two big guards and they go like, Hey bro, do you have your like Orthodoxy papers? Like <laughs> I had this in my mind and like, it kind of freaked me out, but no, like you can always go to a liturgy. You don't even have to, like, you don't even have to go to the liturgy and venerate, uh, icons or anything. You don't have to do that. You can just like walk in and, um, there will be people introducing themselves to you. Certain churches do that. The church I went to the uh, when I was in US did that. They will have people that like check. They will check out the people looking at walking in. And if they saw someone they didn't know, they will ask, "Oh, you know, uh, is this the first time you're coming?" Etc. Uh, and etc. Et and as Jatonik says, don't uh, take communion. Yes, you should not take communion. You should not partake in the Eucharist. That's something only people in the church can do. And the way you 
are in the church is you get baptized and you be, get chrismated. How do you get baptized and chrismated? You become a catechumen. How do you become a catechumen? Well, if you want to become orthodox, you go talk to your priest after the liturgy and ask him, hey, you know, we want to be orthodox. Can you help us out, etc., etc.? And then your priest will set things up with you. So it's it's a very personal process. Uh, Anastasia says, okay, but I did the thing in DM. Oh, thanks. Great. Mord says, asks, what does the church and God say about revolution, political ones especially? I have heard some Christians say that revolution is against Christianity and the church, and reform is the best route. Yeah, this is one of those, like, it's very, it's a very nuanced question, because in so certain cases, the Bible does say you should not do any revolution, uh, you should not go against your God's anointed. Saint David does does not kill Saul for this very reason. But then you read the book of the Maccabees, and in a way, the Maccabean revolt is in a way a revolution, right? So, you know, how do we, what's our stance of revolution? I, I think it's a question that's, that has a lot of nuance. The Maccabean revolt is in a way a revolution, but what's the purpose of that revolution? That's the, I think that is the question that needs to be asked. And the purpose of the Maccabean revolution was to, uh, you know, keep the keep Israel a state that is not constantly uh, attacked because uh, Israel at the time was pressurized, especially religiously. The Maccabean revolt was a revolt against Hellenism. Now, this is not cultural Hellenism. This is not Greek food or whatever, but it's a it's Hellenic religion. So the Maccabean revolt was against the Hellenic religion, against the Hellenic religion trying to integrate itself into Israelite culture, and the Israelites were fighting against it. And so that's what the Maccabean revolt was about. So in a way, there, you know, if you look at the Old Testament, there is there are certain revolutions, but there are other revolutions that you shouldn't do. So it's a question that bears a lot of nuance, and I don't think I can even answer it right now. So it's something that I will have to check up on uh so i'm not really calling for revolutions right now don't ban me youtube i'm not doing anything of that sort but it's a it's a it's a very serious question that needs a lot of nuance i think uh, garden asks when icons are made how did they know how the apostles looked like someone told me saint luke was the first iconographer it kind of inferred the icon that icons were always around is there any more proof we will say in terms of the orthodox christian worldview that uh, we have certain traditions and these traditions and a lot of things that we know about other civilizations, by the way, are also dependent on their traditions. And as a matter of fact, I remember going to this ancient Greek class uh, uh, last semester in college and a question was asked and the question was that, uh, how was the law better preserved? Was it better preserved orally or was it better preserved uh, when it was written, and it turns out that it, that the that the laws, the traditions, are preserved better when they're actually teach teach taught orally. And this is ancient Greece, by the way. So, in our in uh, so how do we know what the apostles looked like? It's because that we have oral traditions, and we have past icons uh, of the apostles, and we base our icons off of uh, those depictions. Now, the earliest, now for example, the earliest icons are not, we don't have them, right? We don't have them anymore, so the earliest icons are kind of later down the road. So what does that mean? Well, I will ask the question, for example, the earliest writings of Aristotle we have is from, I believe, uh, the 11th century. So does that mean that no one had the writings of Aristotle until the 11th century? Of course not. So it, that's the same, that's... It's the same kind of logic. And in terms of proof, I, will, I don't think there's any empirical proof per se, but I will say that when you look at the church tradition, uh, the church, according to the church tradition, that is where the uh, iconography, that is where the depictions are based on. So uh, even as someone that has a completely secular mindset, I will say that there's a very, very high chance that those depictions are indeed faithful to the origin to how the or apostles originally looked so alexander asks what what is our general argument to why the ecumenical council of florence is not ecumenical all right i answered this question this this can be answered in a pretty 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 like i could spend a lot of time answering this question and i will say the receptionism video helps that out 
but basically i will say that the council of florence no matter how many bishops accepted that council it doesn't matter how many bishops accepted that council that's the thing there are many other councils like for example the council of uh, second ephesus 150 bishops most of them agreed with what the council says does that mean that we accepted the council no does that mean that uh, Pope St. Leo accepting that council made that council a robber council? No, it didn't become a robber council just because Pope St. Leo said it's a robber council. That's not the reason. It got the name, maybe, but that's not the reason. Uh, if, the, if the council preaches falsehood like the Council of Florence, then we have no reason to accept the council. And as a matter of fact, many people will say, well, you have a lot of bishops that accepted Florence, but the church as a whole... Didn't, didn't receive the council. And if you look at the reading uh, writings of St. Mark of Ephesus, he writes to many laymen and he says, These don't take communion from the pro-unionists. So that means that there are other churches that are anti-union, right? And that, that the laymen can go for. And a majority of Romans at the time did go to anti-union churches. So the church did not at all receive the Council of Florence and therefore, it's not a dogmatic council, it's not an ecumenical council. Even if it was accepted, only the Constantinopolitan Patriarchate accepted it. Where are the Russian bishops? Where are the Syrian bishops? Where are the Alexandrian bishops? Who is representing them? Right? I asked these questions to a Roman Catholic on Twitter, and he basically didn't even answer. He just said, no, 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 no. there was a lot of bishops, okay? Trust me, there was a lot of bishops. So... The Council of Florence argument is very big. I plan to make a video on it, but that's the answer that I will give to you. Um, Alex Popovich says, Father Mike, Mati Rafael Johnson just did a podcast about it. I guess, yeah, uh, from my understanding, uh, Matthew Rafael Johnson, I think last time I checked him out, he was on a canonical, but then I heard from some other people saying that he's back in a, a canonical church. So I guess you can check him out. He has some insight. I will agree that he has some insight in some regards, but generally, I will. Um, there are other better sources than uh, Michael Matthew Raffel Johnson. Vladimir the Red Sun asks, "Who is the most based saint in your opinion?" Well, the most based saint, in my opinion, is my patron saint, Saint da David Komnenos. A lot of people don't know this, but uh, the last uh, Roman emperor, the last Trebizondian emperor, is is a saint, Saint David Komnenos, and um, it. He's it's it's something like personal, but he uh, he was the he was the emperor of Trebizond. Not say emperor, but Trebizond was kind of like a small city state almost. But he was the emperor of Trebizond um, in 1961. He got sieged by the Turks, and he had to uh, if he tried to defend the city, a lot of Greeks will have died. So in order to protect the Greeks, he will he surrendered. A lot of people say that he's a coward for surrendering, but I think I'm of the opinion that his surrender was based on saving his own people. And on 1463, because the because of the Ottoman Sultan uh, being scared of him trying to usurp the title, which he could have if he had support, uh, but he didn't have it on his mind. But if he had the support, he could have perhaps. Uh, the, the Sultan fabricated some documents of him saying that, ah, oh, I'm going to take the, I'm going to usurp the Ottoman throne. He uh he ended up being martyred and his three sons and a nephew is martyred and i even have an icon of him uh of his three sons and a, and a nephew there's an icon of him he was i think he was canonized in 2013 or 10 i don't remember much but the reason for his canonization was because they did recently found out that that people did venerate Saint David Komnenos, so that was like the reason for his canonization. They recently found out that people venerated him in the past, so that means, oh, you know, if he was canonized beforehand, then you know we can declare it and make it official. Uh, let me just drink some water. Alex Popovich says. He was never excommunicated. He was going to be the proc, but he moved to Roker and said, Oh, if he moved to Roker, then okay, then you can check out his content. As I said, there's some people, parts where I disagree with uh, Father Matthew. Uh, but in terms of politics, it most of them are not political. I think the main issue I have with Father Matthew Rafael Johnson is that he's too much of a fan of uh, pagan philosophy. So he has a very positive view of Platonism. I don't like that. And that's, I think, the only 
it is a somewhat major criticism, but I think that's one of the major points where I will say I don't agree with Father Matthew. But in other terms, I think he's a pretty good priest. If he's really canonical, then I will say, yeah, because he has a lot of good content and a lot of insight. So let's check out. Do you see any do you see any secular mindset being pushed in your uni, uni? Well, I'm in Turkey right now, and I see a lot of secular mindset. I mean it's 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 crazy. I can't I can't even begin to explain how secular it is here, which is I, a lot of people when you know they, they think of Turkey, they think it's like this, oh it's a Muslim country, it's like this like you know, Islamic country and everyone's uh Muslim and etc. etc. No, people there are pretty secular in certain areas. The West, West uh, Turkey is very secular, and in, in universities, in Turkish universities, there's a lot, there's a crazy amount of um, that have uh, anti-Islamic people. There's a lot of communists, a lot of them, and. I mean, just go to a Turkish university and look at the woman, how they dress, and you can see what I'm talking about. I think that's like that's the best litmus test that you can uh, see for like what state of the what state uh, they are in. Like if you if you want to if you want to understand what state what kind of a state that nation is in, look at the way the woman dress. If they dress like men or if they dress like prostitutes, then you know what's going on. <laughs> and that's that's my view. J to Nick asks thoughts on the Oriental so-called Orthodox. Yeah, I had I, I Nick, you know, and we both had to deal with Oriental Orthodox for a very long time together. I think that's like one of the first um, investigations I'd say we we made in terms of Christology and 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 when it comes to the Normie Oriental Orthodox, I'm very I like them a lot. I know I know a lot of um, Coptics. Uh, personal, I, I knew a lot of Coptics personally. I think they're pretty cool people. They are pretty chill. But when when it comes to the trads, I think they're crazy and insane. They're batshit crazy. I, I mean, Roman Catholic trads, you know, they're you know how they act. But Oriental trads are like, woo, okay, that's wild. That's kind of wild. But you know, there's some other, you know, there are certain other Oriental Orthodox, you know, and you can understand them. They they want to defend their their church. And they have a very uh, fundamental disagreement with us. I will say that the Oriental Orthodox they make a few Christological errors that we can go in, but in this is less about my thoughts on Oriental Orthodox and more about the thoughts of how people treat Oriental Orthodox. I don't really like this attitude that we have towards the Oriental Orthodox, where we try to say like, "Oh, we're basically the same," except you know we had these linguistic confusions. No, 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 no. Nick and I had this huge investigation we did this huge investigation different parts this is anything but linguistic errors these errors are very very fundamental in christology and trying to push them off as something that's linguistic as some people do i think it's i think it's kind of arrogant i think it's kind of arrogant and it's very misleading um Alex says uh, MRG is great for historical topics. Yeah, he's pretty decent on history, I will say. Mord asks, speaking of Catholics, oh boy, my favorite part. Speaking of Catholics, what is your best argument to the Catholic Supreme Church argument about Peter building his church? Uh, uh, I, pray, I guess I pray, uh, kind of phrased that wrong. So Peter being direct. Well, there's a lot of I will. There's a lot of different arguments, but they will all push one message and that one message i will say be uh read about early church history that's pretty much if you read early church history you'd have a very hard time remaining a faithful uh, papal supremacist and a lot of normie papal apologetics are starting to understand even uh, even popes are starting to understand our side of the argument uh, because we do live in an information age, so we have a lot of access to information. It's one of the good things about living in the current world. The best, uh, there are a few arguments that I will give uh, against Matthew 16, 18. The first argument I will give is read Matthew 18, 18. Okay, this, uh, 
just read Matthew 18, 18, because it's, I, I will say it completely blows uh, Papal Supremes arguments out of the water. Read the second part of Matthew 16, 18. Is, uh, it's kind of, it's kind of like a quick, witty remark, but I will say, like, if you look at the state of Roman Catholicism today, yeah, sure, you have your TLM masses, and sure, you have your, there's some novice Ordo masses that are kind of cool, come on, don't be, yeah, like, yeah, sure, but there are some other problems going around, and the clown masses that are completely allowed, your second largest cathedral in Latin America is a, is a literal circus mass, you can't allow that to happen. So if you're talking about Matthew 16, 18, though, I will say that, first of all, a lot of church fathers, a lot of church fathers don't interpret the, the rock as being Peter. St. Augustine, for example, says the rock is Christ. And St. Augustine is this big Roman Catholic uh, poster boy. And I love St. Augustine. I'm not anti-St. Augustine. St. Augustine is a great saint. There's a lot of things you can learn from St. Augustine. There's a reason why he's a saint. And uh, he points out that uh, Peter is not the rocks. Now, let's take a look at... If you take a look at the, uh, the fathers that refer to Peter as the rock, St. Peter as the rock, like St. Cyprian, what do they say? St. Cyprian says... That Peter is a rock and every bishop holds the office, holds the chair of Peter. St. Cyprian makes this argument. And there's a guy on Twitter, um, I don't have the post with me right now, but there's a guy on Twitter that made that uh, argument pretty well. And let me, let me see, reader app, I think. Ah. Uh. I can't find it right now, but uh, Saint Cyprian of Carthage and ev literally nearly every single church father interprets uh, Saint Peter as being the rock. As later on, they, they interpret it as every single bishop holding the office of Peter. Saint Augustine says we have the keys. Every single bishop has the keys that Peter was given to. So it's a it's a very weak argument. And finally, I will say if you look at the uh, exchanges of the Pope at the time of uh, 1054 and at the Patriarch of Constantinople and their exchanges, you, you start to understand that uh, you don't see a papal justification by Matthew 16, 18. You see a papal justification by a forged document. And I think that's very, I think that's very crucial in understanding how the schism uh, developed. And so I will say, you know, there's a lot of different arguments that you could use against papal supremacy against Matthew 16, 18. And the orthodox understanding, to, to recap it all, the orthodox understanding that I will say is that Matthew 16, 18 uh, is showing us that all bishops hold the keys, that all the bishops hold the office of Peter. And Peter is the representative not only of Rome, but of, all, but of all bishops. And very easy example we can sh give you to show this is that the reason Rome was such a had, a, had a high place in honor, the reason why Rome was basically patriarch number one was because it was doubly apostolic, right? They don't, they don't, uh, the reason why Rome was uh, number one is because it was Peter and Paul. Because we have other patron sees uh, in Orthodox today. Antioch is a patron see. Alexandria is a patron see. So, so we do have Peter. But Rome does not have the Paul anymore. Ray Koros says, Do you understand J. Dyer's presentation of TAG? Can you explain the premises and show how you go from point to point consistently? Let me... In terms of Jay's argumentation of tag, I think uh, Father Ananias gave a good explanation of it uh, in his server. Let me find where he talks about it. But the general... Uh, so, when it comes to... The way Father Ananias uh, Sorem gives the argument, you should check his channel, Norwegian News is a great channel. Um, the way he presents that argument, he presents it, and his his basic argument is that uh, every worldview is circular, 
and because every worldview is uh, circular, uh, the possibility of knowledge in a way is impossible. Um, hold on, let me just check it out. Give me a second. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll read it from him directly. So he says, here is something I will say the objector to the tag is missing. It is not an argument. It is establishing the preconditions for the possibility of any arguments whatsoever. That is why, although I can put it into a deductive logical form, the truth of it is not dependent upon a deductive argument. It is what makes deductive arguments possible. I know they want me to put it into a logical form so they can attempt to critique it, but that won't work given that the truth of it is not contingent upon logic or deductive arguments. So I will say in a, in a, in a basic bitch level translation, I will say it's the argument itself is how do we even make arguments? How do we even have knowledge? It's that that question itself is tech. So it's very it's very hard. It's very difficult to understand. But uh, Father Ananya Sorum, that's Father Ananya Sorum's take on it. And I will say that I, I share that viewpoint with him. And in regards to circular reasoning, um, every worldview has circular reasoning. Jay hammers this home a lot. And that's why... Uh, he uses that as a refutation of classical foundationalism, which is a lot of people, which a lot of people relies on that. And then Alex Popovich says, what is the Serbian church like compared to Rokor? I've been attending a Rokor church, but it's a 35, 40 minute drive and there's a much closer Serbian church. In uh, okay, so I might be lynched for this, but now I'm not going to get lynched for this. But I went to, I when I was in the US, I went to a EP church i went to a uh, goark church so i don't really know much about other churches but during during uh, lent we had pan orthodox vesper so i had the time to visit a bunch of other parishes and i will say personally serbian churches seem to be fine there i went to a serbian church and it was pretty good it's pretty similar to rocker churches actually in some ways so i will say that the serbian churches are pretty high quality but in general, Rokor in the U.S., from what I understand, is number one. So I'd, I'd say Ro the Rokor church, you go, if you like your church, I think you should stay there. And uh, But if you can you can always check out your Serbian church. It is a parish-by-parish parish basis. Like, of course, the Goark churches, they're not all good, but there are certain good Goark parishes. And the, the Greek church I went to in the U.S. was pretty good. Um a lot, I will have a lot of critiques about it, but the parish life of it, the quality of the priests, they were pretty good. So it really depends on a parish to parish basis. And as I said, if you want to really know, Alex, the best way you can know is probably going to that church. That's the best way you can know for certain. Alex P. asks, what do you think of Western Rite liturgy coming back? A good evangelization tool to bring back in Catholics and Anglicans? Yeah, I mean, it will be pretty great if we had a pre-schism western right but the problem is the pre-schism western like there's no such thing as pre-schism western right to my knowledge um the, the the fake orthodox claim they have an authentic form of western right but i think they're talking out of their ass <laughs> the, the what i will say is that yeah i think i think it's a good evangelization tool and i know there are saints that are pro western right but i i personally have a few objections a few questions i have in my mind that I would love for someone to answer. The first question I will ask is, first of all, um, how do you deal with the fact that you're reconstructing something, right? Even the even the saints that praise Western Rite, like Saint, uh, how can I, Saint John of Shanghai, yeah, great saint, great, great saint. Um, I will ask him, how do you defend the fact that you have to reconstruct a rite? And, and yes, in a way, you know, or or right you know or liturgy the liturgy of saint john chrysostom it's not really the same liturgy 100 percent as saint john chrysostom made but when it comes to general idea when it comes to most aspects we are pretty faithful to his liturgy especially i will say rocco churches are pretty faithful to the liturgy certain greek churches are faithful to the liturgy so how will they deal with the fact that that the western rite is a reconstruction i think that's a huge 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 deal to tackle in regards to that and um, there are certain western right parishes not all but certain western right parishes that do include the heresies 
that a Roman Catholic Church has. For example, Sacred Hearts. There are certain Western Rite prayer books I have seen, I have heard, that has uh, that refer to Thomas Aquinas as a saint. Now, I like Thomas Aquinas. I think Thomas Aquinas was a was a good person. He had a good he had good intentions. In my personal view, he's most likely in heaven. But the moment you put saint and you're a prayer book, the moment you put saint in front of Thomas Aquinas and you're orthodox, that's when I ask what's going on. And certain Preston Rite prayer books do refer to him as saint, do use his prayers, and that makes me uncomfortable. And um, Eucharistic adoration is another thing that they have. And now I'm not really, you know, uh, fully in the Eucharistic adoration debate itself, but. I don't like Eucharistic adoration either because uh, uh, there are, you know, there there are certain intentions with the sacraments. And and Reed, the guy who constantly comments cringe and cope in my comment sections, maybe you guys know him. He made a really good objection. He said that uh, well, okay, but in the Transfiguration at the at the at Mount Tabor, the uh, the apostles wanted to send uh, tabernacles for. Uh, saint uh, for the saints that appeared there for the old testament saints that appeared there with him for saint elijah and, and and such so why don't we do that and then christ said don't do that and there's a re and there's a reason why he says that will it be will it be i uh, will it be a heretical thing to do such a thing no but will it go outside of its purpose Yes, and that's why I think Eucharistic adoration, in my view, goes outside of its purpose. It's not a, it's not a heresy per se, but it's poor praxis, and that's you know my views on Western rites, uh, liturgical. I mean, I would love for something that could be used as a good evangelization tool to bring it in Catholics and Anglicans, and even the Western rite liturgies, even the Western rite itself, right now at this stage, it's a good tool. But I think it has issues, and these issues need to be tackled, in my view. Any op opinions on OCA? Uh, OCA churches are pretty, I will say they're above average. Some OCA parishes are not really good. Some OCA parishes are good. And there's a lot of history between OCA and Rokor, a lot of bad history between them. But overall, it's it's softening up there. They're, they're chill with each other, they, they're obviously in communion with each other, so um, OCA churches are generally good, and I will say that the OCA churches, I don't know, I haven't seen many bad things from them, I, did I go to the OCA church, I, I did go to one OCA church, it was like a Russian church, um, so they, I think Father Ananias is in an OCA church as well. Don't quote me on that, but he's in a Romanian, or he used to be in an OCA church. So there are some really good people. And an example I will give for the OCA church being good is that they don't allow clergy to be pro-homosexual. Um, they, they do actually uh, defrock priests that make pro-homosexual statements. So they do, you know, keep themselves in check uh, regarding that. So in that regard, I will say they're pretty decent. Shining Diamond says, do a video on Protestantism. I mean, I might. Uh, it, like in regards to Protestantism, it's one of those things where yeah, it's it's good to you know teach these Protestants you know what's real. But some sections of Protestantism, not all, but some sections of Protestantism, to me it feels like you know once you learn early church history, why stay Protestant? And there are some people that actually do stay Protestant in spite of learning about the early church fathers. And I don't understand that. I don't understand how you're fine with being Baptist or how you're fine with being Lutheran even, and when, while you know early church history, it's 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 mind blowing to me. I it's it's hard for me to understand. The crepitude has hold on. Let me get some something to drink. How do we have free will if God is omnipotent? I don't know how to answer how to answer this. Omniscient, omnipotent. Oh, omniscient! If He knows everything. <clears throat> well, I will say in regards to free will and omnipotency, we uh, there are good Orthodox articles on predestination, and uh, I will gener generally 
basically I will say in terms of free will, the way you can defend free will is only true worldview. So you can never argue about free will in a vacuum. That's the first thing I will note because the way you can under you can know there is free will and there is no free will is true. Uh, basically worldview comparison because can you uh, just argue about free will in a vacuum and know for certain that there is no free will an example I will give is that let's say you know you have decisions to make right now I have two decisions to make I keep on doing the stream or I close the stream right now and I'm, I'm doing the stream I keep on doing the stream so I can never know for certain whether I could even possibly go for the other choice. You understand what I'm trying to go for? So you have a bunch of paths to go for and you know you've taken a certain path, but you don't know that you've taken other paths. And the question is, can you, could you have taken the other paths? That is really the question. And because of that, you can't argue with free will in a vacuum. You can only argue about it in a, in a, in worldviews. And so I will say, God's omniscient, God being omniscient doesn't really destroy free will in a way because it's still us doing these actions. God knows what we, we are going to be doing, but it's still uh, but it's still us as persons that commit these actions. And I will pretty much say that's that will be my take on the free will argument. So so it's something that that kind of like stuck with me for a long time but eventually you understand that in every every single worldview um in a way free will seems impossible if you look at every single worldview but you just need to understand what we're arguing for in uh, with free will Garden asks thoughts on the Protestant emphasis on evangelization seems like it is treated differently in orthodoxy but I honestly have no idea I mean Protest. The one thing I will note that's good uh, about Protestants is that yes, they do have an emphasis on evangelization, and I think that's a really good thing. I wish, for example, in this in the country I'm in right now, I wish the uh, the patriarchates try to evangelize, or at least there are people that try to evangelize. Now there are certain evangelizations that Protestant groups do that I don't like. Uh, like going up street preaching for example like why would you go to street to preach is someone really going to like say oh you know i'll i'll be a christian because this guy preached about christianity in the street everyone already knows about christianity if he's interested he's going to go look it up himself he doesn't need your preaching right but you can help him push the right direction but that's street preaching don't uh, street pe street preachings don't generally do that but Overall, the emphasis that they put on evangelization, I like it. In terms of orthodoxy, the the way we view it, and I like this view, the way we view it is make sure you yourself are in any way properly Christian and you can you can evangelize that evangelize that way. So if so Saint Seraphim of Sorrow uh, gives this quote, every American uh, Orthodox parish will always use this quote, every priest will use this quote. Uh, if you want to save, uh, I believe, 5,000 souls, start with yourself. It's something, I'm paraphrasing here, it's not a direct quote. Uh, and the argument that he's putting forth is that if you yourself are holy, people looking at you will start to ask questions and start to think that perhaps the doctrine that this guy is following really is a true doctrine. So there's there's a double emphasis. It's not just us going out out and preaching. Well, yes, in, in some aspect, we should be preaching, we should be telling people about the faith verbally, but in other aspects, it's about you living a Christian life and impressing people. Now, we don't, we don't try to impress people by acting like, by, you know, a lot of people do this, like by saying like, oh, I'll pray for you, dear, or like um, being fox spiritual, you don't do that either, but <clears throat> you try to do it by humility and by acting as a proper christian thank you for doing the stream right now it's my pleasure i mean it's been going good doing blah, blah, blah. it's been going well so far uh 24 views right now that's pretty good for a 500 subscriber channel you sound like an arkadash i am an arkadash i am a friend yeah <laughs> and uh i'm oh i didn't i just this it's a great thing you said that because i just forgot to answer a question 
about where I'm from. Um, <laughs> well, I guess I could just answer it after an hour. Well, in terms of where I'm from, I was born in Norway. I uh, I lived in Norway for nine years. That's where my accent is from. At least that's what people say my accent is from. <clears throat> Uh, I lived in Norway for nine years. We moved to Turkey. I lived there for nine years. My name is Turkish. I have a Turkish citizenship, so I am pretty much Turkish. But um, uh, in terms of ethnicity, I will say I'm half uh, Greek, half Laz. Uh, my my mom comes from Trebizon. My dad my dad's dad is from uh, Thessaloniki, and my dad's mother is from Hopa, which is a Georgian village. So, yeah, I'm like, I'm like half Greek, half Laz, Norwegian citizen, Swedish citizen, Turkish citizen, lived in the U.S. as well. I moved to U.S. Uh, one and a half years ago, studied there for three semesters, and now I'm back in Turkey and rotting in here instead of in the U.S. So, um, good stream. Thanks, Jay. It's good to see you. Uh, good to see Jay Dyer in here. I don't, did I miss out any questions? I don't think I did. But I came late. Yeah, I mean, Jay has a lot of great content. I will say in terms of like how I ended up learning all this stuff, a lot of a lot of his a lot of it was with Jay. I would say that like the voice chat sessions he did on Discord was pretty helpful. I I remember at one period, I, I believe in the beginning of this year summer, I would like constantly ask him questions. And like he will answer, and I'm like, oh, okay, I start to understand it now. So like, um, the it shows us. I think one thing that people like Jay shows us, and people like Father Anania Sorum shows us, is that there's a lot of depth in orthodoxy, and it is very difficult to understand at times. Thanks. We'll do. Yeah, yeah. It's it's gonna be great. So um, I guess I do. I don't have. Are there any more questions? No, not so far. So one thing I had on mind that I did want to actually talk about is let me look at my let me let me look at my stream list. Do, 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 do. Zealot video game. Oh yeah, there's a new video game coming out called Zealot, and I posted this I posted about this on Twitter. The from the dev, developer diaries and from the from the gifs and from the videos from the trailers that, that I've seen. You, to me, it seems like you play as a priest, right? You play as a priest in a world, um, and that was tried. Like there's missionaries are sent to that area that you are in. They ended up dying. The locals basically killed you to save to secure their pagan gods, and then the pagan gods, I believe, evoke, and now you're like the the only uh, priest, only Orthodox Christian left there, and your job. From the script, from the videos I've seen, your job as a priest is basically kill those uh, pagan gods, pagan demons, and whatnot. So, from from first glance, it seems like uh, seems like a okay game. But if it's if it turns out to be like um, you know, all oh, priest is murdering everyone or like some very hard hardcore larpy stuff, you know, it can be like that. So it will be on the a uh, garden. In all fairness, he was pretty very against the game and i i do actually see his point um many many points out if, if it turns out like you're playing as a priest it's like killing people like killing human beings and you that's your job it's like that's not cool that like you our priests are not supposed to be doing any of that stuff but if, if it's like you know spiritual warfare if the emphasis on spiritual warfare then it's a pretty you know it might be a pro-orthodox game you know Garden asks, why do Baptists think they have a lineage of true churches through the Valdensians, Paulicians, Algensians? Maybe this is silly, but what is the best rebuke of that? I mean, the best rebuke of that is the fact that all of these peoples that they think they have lineage from have different doctrines. They don't have the same doctrines. They all have different views, radically different views. Um, so I think that will be the best rebuke of that. I mean, if the, the basic argument that the Baptists give, like they try to do this because they notice that there's a there's an early church. Right, they they see okay, so there is this part of history called the early church Christianity. So we need to look into that, and they look at the like the, uh, they look at the early church and they see what the early church preaches. Naturally, they don't like any of that because nothing of that sort comes close to Baptists. 
So instead they say, okay, how can we have a connection with the early church but still remain the way we are? Oh yeah, the people that these are that the early church fought against, they are actually us. So they they use this trail of blood argument. They see that um, a lot of these um, a lot of these uh, patriarchs, a lot of uh, a lot of the members of the early church spoke heavily against it. Uh, the Roman Empire certainly persecuted a lot of heretics. They also persecuted, like, they pretty much persecuted everyone at certain different points. But a lot, there were a lot of persecutions of heretics that especially started like going crazy, like literally burning churches or killing people, right? So a, a very funny comment was that uh, by uh, Hera Bubu, one of my Albanian friends, was that uh, either him or Alyosha. He, they said that uh, 5th century Alexandria is basically Los Santos. <laughs> because if you read the period, a lot of crazy stuff's going on. So Jay says most of those groups are Aryan and Trinitarian. They are, yeah. Even if they, even, they're implicitly, in my view, they're pretty anti-Trinitarian. They will profess the Trinity to remain Christian. But when you dig deep into their doctrine, uh, even Baptists themselves, you, you don't see the Trinitarianism. And a lot of these groups that they they see, they think that they have connections with, they're not even Trinitarian either. So like, as I said, a lot of these heretical groups have different doctrines and their doctrines don't even match up with the Baptist doctrine. So it's really just a cope. It's it's the Baptist cope. So the Roman Catholic, you have the Roman Catholic copes and you have the Baptist Protestant copes. Alex P. asks, you think Erdogan will be successful in making Hagia Sophia mosque? What are the relations like between Muslims and Orthodox in Turkey? Uh, in Erdogan, I don't think he will be successful. Uh, it's kind of like, like Hagia Sophia. It's, it, it's only relevant when people are talking about it. But usually in, you know, for the Orthodox or for the Muslims, it's like... Whatever, but the moment someone talks about it, suddenly it becomes an important issue. I don't really know why. I don't think he will make it a mosque. I don't even think he wants to make it a mosque. And publicly, he says he wants to. But privately, I think he's just doing it as like a gauge. Like he's gauging his strength, right? Because if he says, oh, we're going to make Hagia Sophia a mosque, then he can check the reactions of the other world powers, of the elites and whatever. And he can uh, check, the, uh, check the reactions, gauge their reactions to see... Uh, where he stands diplomatically and i think that's what erdogan is trying to do i mean a lot of people in turkey hate erdogan i don't like erdogan at all but i think a lot of people say he's not intelligent i think he's very intelligent and i think he knows what he's doing the, what he's trying to do i don't like it at all but i know i think i know what he's doing what are the relations like between muslims and orthodox in turkey uh for there to be relations first of all there needs to be orthodox in turkey i mean jokes aside i was i I haven't really seen, but I will say that uh, if you have a crucifix necklace and you're outside in Istanbul, or if you're, you know, going outside in in generally secular areas of Turkey, no one's going to going to say anything to you. Everyone's pretty chill about it. But in regards to Muslims, the most Muslims today are very like the proper Muslims, not the uh, those that call themselves Muslims but don't go to mosque, but the Muslims that are that go to mosque and etc. I think they're very on edge about Christianity itself. There, there used to be a certain American pastor used by intelligence agencies that was going to be imprisoned. And I think pastor, pastor, hold on, uh, Brunson, what was his name? Pastor Brunson. Yeah. Pastor Andrew Brunson uh, was going to be uh put in jail but then he turns out turned out to be like he the, the u.s government freed him so there was like an incident regarding that so that so the turks are kind of like you know what's going on here so they're very of christians in terms of the orthodox it's like whatever i mean it, there's not really much of a connection between us um there are of, of course some muslims are very on edge and very anti-christian there's a lot of like I, my mother's side of the family is very Muslim and they do have a they don't have a vi like crazy anti-Christian attitude but they do have an attitude against Christianity they think they think the Bible is like has been corrupted you know the basic Islamic talking point against Christianity. Uh, Jay Dyer asks, what theological philosophical issue really got you into Orthodox? Was there a central issue or breaking point? I 
I won't say there was any central issues. I will be completely honest. And personally, my heritage, I didn't become Christian because of my heritage. But I did become interested and I did start to research because of my heritage. That's what got me into researching it. And I looked in and as time went on, generally, holistically, when I looked at Christianity, to me, it seems like the religion that made the most sense to me. And there's not really a specific breaking point. I, I was aware of different uh, Christian traditions like Roman Catholicism, Protestantism, and they, they seemed to me that they were missing a lot of crucial things. And orthodoxy just covered those crucial things. And I think that's what really helped me uh, say, yeah, I've, 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 orthodoxy makes the most sense for me. And over time, you know, as I, as I started learning, I, like when I started to learn about orthodoxy, it made me like it more. And I ended up converting because of that. And then Jay says... Those fringe groups are used by yeah. I mean, Pastor Brun. I I don't think Pastor Brunson is innocent at all. I definitely think he was used by intelligence agencies. But Turkey, the Turkish government doesn't have enough strength to you know tell you know imprison one of his agents. What are they gonna do? Like they they just straight up had to release him to the U.S. And yeah, I mean the Turkish government itself is trying to purge a lot of different groups. And they seem like the U.S. seemed to take note of that, and they managed to get one of their assets back into the U.S. safe and secure. What helped reassure you that you were in the correct denomination, True Church, when you were new? Um, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, Jade, yeah, I just checked, saw your. Did you see the Ortho Christian article that vindicates your TO debunked article and my own analysis? Are you talking about um, Panagiotis's article? on ortho christian because a lot of the references that i used was from that um i did i did check out a lot of like the uh the tos being used by intelligence agencies i did check them out but generally in terms of you know arguing against what the tos believe that roca the roca schism oh yeah i did yeah i did see that i did see that yeah 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 it's it's wild i mean it, that will be the first time that happened uh, I did see that link. It's it's crazy. And as as you mentioned before, time and time again, uh, a lot of the intelligence agencies are using these schisms to sever the church apart. And I will I won't even be surprised if they're doing this against the Roman Catholic Church either. I, I they they're probably doing these things to Roman Catholics as well. And uh, but generally, you know, these uh, these schisms, these these fake Orthodox groups are weaponized against orthodoxy and and of course this doesn't this doesn't mean that we have we don't have issues in, in the orthodox church we have a lot of issues but that but we have a lot of issues as the true church right so just posting about or bishops doing bad things doesn't really mean anything at the end of the day garden asks what helped me assure you that you were in the correct denomination well, i would say over time when i was in orthodox and i learned about other denominations it, it was a it in a way it was a gut feeling, but in terms of the Roman Catholics, I, when I was growing up, I uh, I was kind of educated a lot about Roman Catholics and what they believe and what they think in, and when I read the Bible, when I read the scriptures, I never understood how this papal supremacist view came to be to my view to my understanding, and when I looked at the early church, and then I look at the Roman Catholic Church, there's no connection between them. Zero connection. <laughs> There's zero connections between them. Theologically, doctrinally, praxeologic, in praxis, there is no connection. And of course, with Protestants, um, naturally, there is a there were a reaction against the Roman Catholic Church. So, from my understanding at the time, I viewed the Roman Catholic Church as some sort of an offshoot of the of the true Church, and that the Protestants were a reaction against that offshoot, a legitimate reaction, but they ended up completely missing the mark. And I didn't really know much about the Oriental Orthodox until after I got baptized, actually. Uh, so I didn't really have any time to consider it against them. But now that I managed to learn about the uh, Oriental Orthodox, Oriental so-called Orthodox, now I'm also aware of them too. And I was pretty tempted about uh, Oriental Orthodoxy, actually. There was a lot of like... But... All of that helped me learn a lot about Christology. So I'm pretty happy. Like, that's the thing. Like, you might be tempted 
to apostatize at times, but if you stay strong and if you keep on researching, you will find things that makes you go, oh, so that's how it is. And for me, it was like that in terms of learning about other denominations. Proud Albanian JC Denton asks, is anyone else in your family also Orthodox? I am the only Orthodox Christian in my family. And I have a huge family. I don't have a lot of siblings. I have, I'm, I'm, I'm an only child, but I have a lot of cousins. And I'm the only Orthodox Christian. I'm the only Christian, not even just Orthodox, but just the only Christian overall. My mother's side of the family and the patriarchs of her family, most of them, if not all, are very Muslim. Uh, their children are not very Muslim, which is what's happening in Turkey. I mean, it's crazy. You have a lot of these like hard-ass Muslim fathers, and then you look at their children, and they're anything but Muslim. They're like they're the, they're your general, they're your typical young people that uh, engage in the world. So, <laughs> I, I that's always fascinating to me about uh, Muslim families. I will say. Uh, Super Tiger Road Trip says, when I start to believe in Christ again and LARP is a set of a contest briefly, I never found any evidence for papal supremacy. It was always just assumed that, yeah, I mean, even if you have that, like, it's just a single verse in Matthew 16, 18, like, just one verse. Now, I am aware that the set of a contest did release in it. I don't know if it's a new video or they say that John 15 proves papal supremacy. Probably not. It's probably some bullshit argumentation. But generally, when I look at the Bible, uh, it's it's very it's very silly. It's very the argumentation uh, for papal supremacy is just not there. I don't see any papacy in the Bible. I have a hard time seeing seeing any papacy in the Bible. I do see some quotations from the Father that might be perceived as papacy, but when you understand the true context, when you understand what they're really arguing for, and when you're understanding how the church worked in the first centuries. There is no papacy there. There is nothing. If you look at the Christological councils, if you look at the ecumenical councils, there is no papacy there. Why do you even have councils if there is papacy? I mean, the, uh, the papacy has councils even now. Why do you have those councils? <laughs> it's, it's silly. Uh, Jay says, great point. I had all the same temptations and the controversy helped me understand. Yeah, I mean, those temptations do help you out a lot. Uh, I believe Jay to Nick asked... A time ago, are you are the rumors true that the podcast with you, Nick, and Boo Boo might happen? Hey, that's your rumor. I'm down for podcast, whether it's gonna be on my channel or some other channel. I don't really mind. Uh, it will be a fun time. This this stream is teaching me how to talk all along. <laughs> it's pretty good. Garden asks, is there every is there ever going to be some official official Orthodox English Bible? Well, there's not even an official official. Orthodox Greek Bible. There's no like official official Orthodox I don't know Russian Bible. I mean in terms of the translations I think there's time I think there does need to be some Orthodox that need to make a proper translation. We're still yet to see one uh, but in, currently the, here's the thing there's a lot of translations in the, in the NKGV and in the KGV that are completely off. They will translate bishops to overseers or something like that, like they would completely translate. There is a Protestant translation, right? And then you look at the Douay Rheims edition, and sure, it's more faithful, but it also has its issues. So, I will generally say that with the translations, the translations are not actually that important. What's really important is how you understand what's written, and that's why the Orthodox Study Bible is so great because sure you had the new King James version okay you had a new King James version but you had the annotations you read a verse and then you look at below and it says uh, the NKG translation uses overseer but actually it means bishop and it, and it comes from the Greek word episcope so you have those those annotations you have those details in the Orthodox study Bible so even though it is not a, a perfect translation at all not even close to perfection the the fact that the the orthodox study bible helps remedy that and so for the time being i think it's the best thing and in perf in a, in a perfect world we will have an orthodox translation proper orthodox translation but it's not really it's not that much of a big issue i had the same question i had i was wondering like which translation is the most closest to truth is it the kgv is it the niv is it the uh, uh, rsnv like whatever and the translations don't actually matter that much now, in terms of uh, Old Testament translations, 
The Orthodox Study Bible uses the LXS, the Septuagint translation, mostly. Uh, so, and it has its like kind of like its own translation. So the Old Testament, which is like the bulk of the Bible, if you think about it, the Fathers refer to the Old Testament as the Scriptures, actually. So for them, the Old Testament was the Scriptures, and the bulk of the Bible is still it still has an orthodox translations and so i've been reading a lot of them uh over the past couple months uh and it's very it's very 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 faithful to its original translation in my view jay asks will you will you say most turkish youth are degenerate is turkish culture as crap as the u.s yes it is just as crap it's the u.s is a very special kind of crap but i will say when it comes to the internet turkish youth it's very russian so the russian internet youth and the turkish internet youth are the same they like they don't like speaking english they only make jokes about degenerate stuff and very popular internet like turkish internet jokes are about porn stars so for example johnny sins is very loved in turkey which is insane to me i mean it's insane to me that they oh and one thing that's very crazy about turkish culture turkish jokes is that they worship black porn stars I don't understand that. I like. I remember as a teenager, I would like be in these like Turkish meme groups, and a lot of the posts will be a lot, uh, about like, oh this, oh I wish my dick was as big as this black porn star. It's like what? Like, are you dumb? <laughs> that it's bizarre. Yeah. So the Turkish youth is very degenerate. Even the Muslims are very degenerate. They're not like. There is a lot. There are a lot of Muslims. They go to the mosque. And they're like, oh, you know, I gotta please Allah, and then they go and drink alcohol, and they have sex with a bunch of women, uh, and uh, if they can, they have sex with a bunch of women. That is, and it's it's crazy, it's bizarre. I mean, Turkey is is just as bad as other European countries. It's very bizarre. Uh, Super Tiger Road Trip says, I stayed at a monastery, and from speaking with folks, there seems to be consistent that Theos schisms from Rokor start after Rokor. Sorry, yeah, Rokor. They ended up cracking, uh, crack down on 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 the CIA. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of aware of that. Garden says, does the warning in Revelations about adding removing from Scripture imply that there is some true translations? Now, I don't want to answer the, the this question, not because the Book of Revelation is not my strong suit. I will be completely honest with that. It's it's, I mean, it's a very difficult book to understand, even regarding OSB. So, I won't say that it implies a true translation. I don't think it does. I don't think there are fathers that push this sort of an idea. Or that, I won't say this is the, the consensus of the fathers. So, from first glance, I won't say that that is the case. But, as I said, the book of Revelation, it's... I'm not going to dive into the territory where I'm not really well versed in. I, I don't want to teach something that's wrong. Um, Super Tiger Road Trip says, So the Turkish youth culture is just all gachimuchi posting. Well, they don't know gachimuchi, but it is very, like, there's a lot of affination with porn stars. Yeah, like, there's, it's insane. I remember the first time I ended up interacting with, like, porn was, like, this kid in my class at 7th grade who had an iPad and, like, uh, we will have like club times at, at particular days, like Thursdays. You will stay after school and like you'd go to a club. And I remember like uh, like I my club will be, will end. I had to go to the chess club because I used to play chess pretty seriously. Um, and after being done with my chess club, I will go see this kid after class. And like he will be in class and like he'd, he'd be looking at his iPad like, Hey, you know, what are you what are you checking out? And he's like, he's looking at me, and I look at his iPad, and he's just looking at porn. And, <laughs> and I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> it's 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 so insane. And he will, and you will expect him to keep it to himself. But no, then like, I will hang out with these Turkish kids in like groups of five. And I wasn't a really a popular kid, but I was just like listen to the things they say. And like he's like, oh bro, you know, like this 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 porn is so epic. And like. In my mind, like, what is going on? What's wrong with these people? <laughs> they will they will be talking about pornography in class. And, and as I said, these are seventh grade kids. And it's it's wild. It's crazy. The, the, the Turkish youth is very. There's a lot of problems with them. I'm. I can I can go on about it, but there's a lot of like 
And this is a pri by the way, the school I went to, this is not some shitty public school, by the way. You might say, oh, you know, you're talking about the shitty public school. No, 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 no. This is a private high school. This is like the one of the top tier uh, private schools that I went to in seventh grade. It's one of the most esteemed schools that I went to. And they still do this kind of shit. So imagine what they do in public schools here. I went to a public school for a chess tournament and you had a bunch of kids that will like, um, uh, there's this weird thing in Turkey where they will like, uh, they will like, uh, put your, like, they won't put your hands on your crotch, but they will do a motion of, uh, putting their hands on your crotch and then like put it, they won't touch it, but they will like do something like that. And then like, uh, that's something that was very popular. And like, I would see a bunch of Turkish kids do this shit, do that shit to me. And I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with you kids? What are you doing? It's Turkish culture is so insane, man. Everyone thinks that Turks are, and not everyone, but a lot of people think think that Turks are base and like very pious, and uh, not at all. They're they're a bunch of pieces of shit, just as Europeans and Americans are. Jay uh, Jay asks, does the Turkish mafia have a lot of influence? Oh, there's a lot of different. Uh, political groups a lot of them are religious based i will say a lot of them are also secular um so for example erdogan um before he became a president was backed by the naqshbandi naqshbandi faction and so there's a it's crazy because islam has a bunch of different factions like you don't have factionalism in orthodoxy but in sunni islam you have like a bunch of different factions and they teach different things so the naqshbandis were literally like Ottoman restorationists. They wanted the Ottoman Empire to be restored again, and their big, their big mufti will like speak about how Erdogan is going to establish a new Ottoman Empire. Now, 20 years have passed since uh, the election of Erdogan, and we don't see anything close to that. A lot of people think that we are seeing such such things, but I don't think that's ever going to happen. So I would say, um, you know, there's a lot of influence of Turkish mafia. There's a lot of like. I've lived here for nine years. Every time I look at the news, it's always some like court case going on, like Ergenekon court case or uh, Fethullah Gülen now. Now Fethullah Gülen is supposed to, is this Turkish mafia that we need to get rid of. And there's a lot of like mafias that we might not even know about, that we have not even heard about. And um, in terms of uh, Turkish mafia having a lot of influence on culture, I think the religious mafia will definitely want them to be more Islamized and there's a lot of like um, different in educational institutions that were part of Fethullah Gülen. But generally we're seeing that uh, the secular mafia is pretty much uh, winning influence over these people actually. It depends on the parts of the country. So if you go to Konya, um, a lot of conservatives there. Uh, there's a lot of conservatives there so it really depends on regions region and region uh, western turkey it's pretty much all secular mafia members i mean for example i will say now i don't want to i don't want to name names if, if if someone catches it i might get in jail but uh there's a lot of like big people in turkey that are very well received but i think they're part of like a secular mafia in west turkey and they have they're in beef with the uh islamic mafia um Super Tiger Roadship sounds like the Turkish game mafia is what has power. I mean, the funny thing is, Islam is a degenerate religion. It is a degenerate religion. I mean, one of the things I, I remember, I used to be in this Turkish incel server. Don't tell me how I managed to get in there. I used to be in this Turkish incel discord server. And you, I, there were, everyone in that server was Muslim, but none of them believed in God. And you will ask them, why are you Muslim? They don't even go to the mosque, by the way. They're just Muslim in name. Because Islam is so based, like it's against women and um, and all that sort of bullshit. And they will, they will, you know, one of the reasons why they don't like women is because, oh, women commit adultery a lot and like blah, 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 blah. But then they will talk about Islam and you getting war bribes. And no, 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 no. Islam says that uh, having sex with your war brides, that's not adultery. And But women, these women doing uh, being hypergamous, that's adultery. But no, 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 it's not adultery when we do it. So 
even amongst the uh, traditional ones, it's incredibly degenerate. And if you look at the Ottoman Empire, there are a lot of degenerate drones. One of the more popular ones is this this drawing of like a bunch of Ottoman dudes, um, like forming a human centipede with their penises up their <laughs> ass. I mean, it's it's there's a lot of degenerate history that uh, that people in Turkey don't want to talk about because Turkish people do pretend to have this facade of uh, being, you know, conservative, moral people. There's still that facade, there's still that mask, but I think in 10 years or so, that mask is going to slip. So in your opinion, what's the ETA on Constantinople being li getting liberated? Uh, nah, never. I don't think it's going to be liberated at all. I think that's a pipe dream. It's not going to happen. Uh, Constantinople, I live here. It's, uh, even if you're liberated, what are you going to do about it? What's gonna happen? This this city is a shithole. <laughs> what are you gonna do about the city? There's a lot of things you need to work on, and I really doubt that's gonna happen. So I think that's a that's a that's a LARP talk. Jace, as Gulen was a CIA operation, many said, yeah, he lives in the United States. No doubt he's CIA. No doubt he's FBI. No zero doubts about that. Uh, Jay Dyer asks, is Turkey and Hagia Sophia worth visiting? I think Turkey is worth visiting. It's not because of it being Turkey. It's because of there's so many, there are so many, her, there's so much Orthodox heritage even in Turkey today. I went to Nikaya a couple months ago, and the 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 church that the that the Seventh Ecumenical Council was made in was still there. It was a mosque though. It was it was still there, and I have I posted a lot of pictures. Uh, about the remaining icons. One very interesting thing about that church was that uh, they had a they had a mosaic of the universe, and it proposed a geocentric understanding of the universe. So the Earth was at the center, and then you had a bunch of other planets. As a matter of fact, you had like seven planets around Earth, I think. And I no doubt there's also biblical uh, symbol symbolism there, but. Uh, that like when they talked about the mosaic, they said that that was like some kind of like a um, mosaic about the universe. So that that was pretty interesting to me. <clears throat> um, so I will say, yeah, Turkey is worth visiting, but Istanbul is definitely worth visiting. It's it's like New York. I will not live in New York, but I will visit it because there's some things worth seeing. But Istanbul, there's there's so many things to see, and there are still many churches here in Istanbul. Um, I mean, the ecumenical patriarchy churches here. Uh, there's a Bulgarian church. There's a there's a Russian church that's under a monastery in Mount Athos, which is very interesting. And there's a bunch of different churches going around. So there's there's a lot of uh, Orthodox heritage in Turkey, but you do need to. You do need to know where you're visiting, and you do need to know how Turkish people act. Turkish people are pretty chill, actually, in general, um, especially against tourists. But you do need to watch out for, you know, they're kind of sly, right? So if you if you try to buy something for five Turkish liras, they'll try to sell sell you that for ten Turkish liras. And so and you kind of also need to know where you are going. Um, so yeah, I will I will say that it's worth going, but you need to go with a tour, with a tour guide that knows what he's doing. Uh, Squant, wow, this is a crazy insight to Turkish. I mean, I'm probably like one of I'm probably the only uh, Orthodox Christian in Turkey at this age. Probably I haven't seen any Orthodox Christian my age yet in Turkey. So. Uh, I can like only I can probably give these kinds of insight, and I think it's important because Turkey is a very special country. I still think it's a very special country. I still have some sort of a, uh, I have a very very deep connection to this land, and uh, because let's be honest, today's Turkey, every single ecumenical council, every single Christological council was done in today's Turkey. How can you say that Orthodoxy doesn't have any connection with Asia Minor? And I'm not talking about this like paganistic land connection but you still have this sort of connection with with the people from there with the latter so many of our saints were anatolians saint gregory of nyssa nyssa is in anatolia and um i went to saint uh saint nicholas of mira's house in uh in demre 
That's the name. That's the Turkish name of it. In Demre, there's Saint Nicholas's house, and we even bought an icon of it. And this happened when I was like 10 years old or 11 years old. When I was like, uh, when I didn't even know anything about Christianity itself, even. So, a lot of places worth visiting in Turkey. But as I said, you do need to know. Uh, you do need to have a someone that knows what is doing and. In terms of Turkish society and insights, I mean, it's people don't really know how Turkish people are, and even Turkish people themselves, they're not very honest about Turkish people. I think. Um, are there any actually? Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Proud Albanian then JC then says we heard that the Ottoman Empire decriminalized gay marriage in 1895. Or oh, I, I, I wasn't actually aware of that, but I won't be surprised at all. That probably. Because at that period, the Ottoman Empire was looking into westernizing because they realized that they were basically dying. So they tried. So a lot of people in the Ottoman Empire thought that, hey, if you become more like the West, we won't die. Surprise, uh, you became more like the West and you died. <laughs> Super Tiger Road Trip says, are there any actually Turkic looking people left in Turkey? Or are they all just pseudo gay reeks and Anatolians? They're pretty much all pseudo gay reeks and Anatolians. They're pretty much all of them. Um, there are some Turkic looking people in, left in Turkey. Um, I will say, for example, there's a there's a soccer player named Umut Bulut. Let me let me let me find him. Okay, I'll post a. This is a this is a picture of Umut Bulut. So this guy, this guy that I just posted, he. He he looks Turkic, right? But then you have people like Kıvanç Tatlıtu. And how does Kıvanç Tatlıtu look? Well, let me just post a picture of him as well. And the second picture I posted, that's Kıvanç Tatlıtu. So these two people, notice that these two people are both Turks. But... Genetically speaking, they're probably not in any way really like close to being with each other. They're from two different ethnic groups. But if you ask a Turk, they're, oh, you know, I just see two Turks here. Like, post these pictures side by side and ask a Turk what you see. And he'll say, oh, I just see two Turkish people. <laughs> and it's so silly. So there, a lot of them are Anatolians that apostatized and uh, became Muslims. A lot of them... Um, you know, some of them apostatized early on, some of them apostatized later on, and some of them apostatized not in Asia Minor, but in Greece, right? And the population exchanges, as a matter of fact, the population exchange happened uh, by uh, religion, right? So if you're an Orthodox Christian, you were a Greek. If you're a Muslim, you were a Turk. So what happens if you're a Greek Muslim? Well, you're considered as a Turk. What happens if you're a Turkish Orthodox? Well, you're, you're Greek now. So... It is pretty silly uh, how Turkey is like that. And if you point this out to Turks, they will get really mad. And there's a video of a bunch of Turkish people taking DNA tests. And majority of them got Greek DNA. And a lot of them got like, there's a lot of West Asian DNA. And West Asian DNA is not even Turkish DNA at all. West Asian DNA is, uh, well, it's pretty wide, but uh, it's Anatolian, it's Georgian, Caucasian. And Persian, even some as some Persian, some Middle Eastern, but generally I would say Anatolian and and Caucasian. So that's the best. Age. So most Turks are like that. But they, if, as I said, if you tell this to them, they get mad. There's a post of some Turkish guy that made on a YouTube comment. He got a he got 90% Greek in a DNA test, and then he said, "Oh, the DNA tests are Zionist uh, plots against uh, against the Turkish people." Now, DNA tests are not all cool and great and all that. There's definitely a lot of problems with DNA tests, but they're not, <laughs> a, a, they're not a conspiracy against Turkish people. So, people. so Turkish people are pretty crazy like that. They think, they think everyone in the world hates them. They have this victim complex uh, as well. Uh, I, I visited Istanbul. Alex says, I visited Istanbul 10 years ago. It's pretty impressive. Plus, food. Yeah, the food and accommodations are pretty cheap, especially now today. The Turkish lira is very... It's it's shit tier right now. It's it's worthless. So because it's worthless, uh, a lot of things are cheap. Like, uh, let, me, let me find it. So in my university, 
uh, a a tavuk döner, a chicken döner is like the 13 Turkish lira. Uh, let me co convert that to dollars. So that's 2.27 US dollars. So for two US dollars, I'm eating a a chicken döner. <laughs> Very cheap food, basically. Very cheap food, and it's high quality too. So it's not. It's not as if I'm eating. It's not as if I'm eating Chinese gutter oil. Uh, Garden says, "Oh, proud Albanian J C Denton says, do you still have that icon of Saint Nicholas of Mira? I have it, just not with me. And I should have took it with me because I actually want to bless it. I don't think that icon is blessed. Um, I, my parents will definitely not know. So I will like." It is, it is like, a, it is, I think it's a legitimate icon. It seems like a legitimate proper icon, but it needs to be blessed. I don't think it's blessed by a monastery. I don't think it's blessed by a, uh, by a church. I don't think there's even a church left in, in Mira now, which is crazy. Like a lot of, a lot of places where these saints lived in there, a lot of these places, they don't have churches anymore. They don't have functioning churches anymore. Garden says, when I started going to a kind of small parish, two other random dudes my age started going almost at the same time. Very cool. Yeah, in the U.S., you're seeing a lot of people getting into Orthodox, and I think that's great. But uh, I think there needs to be a lot of, like, proper teaching to these people as well, because um, a lot of people do end up getting into this cage stage. And we want to prevent that. We want to prevent that. We want them to have a smooth sailing and become Orthodox, both intellectually but also spiritually. Uh Nick, J Tourist Vlog in Turkey event. Yeah, Jay, you gotta you gotta see it. <laughs> vlog in Turkey. That would be that would be pretty cool. Sebastian here says hello. Hello, Sebastian. Ognash says, what does the average Turk think about Turkish migrants in Germany and you in general? Oh boy, they don't like them. <laughs> they hate them. They hate them so much. And especially the secularists hate them because the Turkish migrants in Germany are very Islamic. Right, they're very Islamic. They're very Muslim. They're more Muslim than the ones in Turkey, and they vote for Erdogan. And so the secularists are like, "If you want Erdogan so much, then live in Turkey, you piece of shit." And so a lot of Turks um, in Turkey they don't like migrants in Germany. They they dislike him. Uh, EU, they used to like want to be in EU. Now they're like whatever. Now it seems like I think every Turk has realized that we're not that they're not getting into the EU. They shouldn't get into the EU anyway. And yeah, many Kurds are or at least pretend to be Turks. I will generally agree. Yeah, I think I think there are Kurds that pretend to be Turks. Migrant Turks around here always blame everything on supposed PKK. Yeah, PKK is this Kurdish terrorist organization. And uh, they hate it because PKK kills a lot of Turks. Like they attack Turkish uh, villages, Turkish military, and yeah, they have a lot of bad blood between. I don't really have anything to say between the PKK and Turkey. I don't really. It's just something that has been going on forever, and no doubt PKK is back. It's basically a geopolitical geopolit thing, but. I think the PKK is putting a lot of pressure between the Kurds and the Turkish populace. Alex P. I never liked the Turks in Germany. Whenever I'd visit my cousins and go out, there was always trouble. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really know what I can say. I mean, I, I, I agree with you. I went to Kern uh, a couple of years ago, and there were streets that were completely Turkish. They had Turkish signs, Turkish restaurants. You go to a Turkish restaurant, they don't even start speaking German with you. They, speak, they just say... They start this. What do you want? That's what they start with, and I, I mean, Germany is. I mean, Kern is basically a Turkish city at this stage. I mean, it's not fully a Turkish city, but it is becoming a Turkish city. And Erdogan himself has state has wants to use this uh, as a political power because he recently said that uh, he told the Turkish people in Germany that they should vote for the Turkish. Party, that they should vote against Angela Merkel because Angela Merkel did something bad against the Turkish government and uh, he that Erdogan tried to flex against Merkel. Now Erdogan obviously knows that Merkel is that uh, that her party that that whoever is reigning in Germany is going to be uh, you know about the same political group. But I think he was just trying to flex and say, look, boys, 
I'm in here. I, I'm I'm going to flex my power over you. You have a lot of Turks. I can use them against you. And the Germans are recognizing that. Um, Ognash says, it's crazy. As soon as they're in a group, they'll start provoking people. Yes, they. There's that's Turkish people in Germany do that. Turkish people in Turkey, do they do that? I haven't seen them do that, personally. Sebastian Hirsch asks, what will you say to somebody who agrees that besides scripture, there was oral tradition by the apostles, as they themselves said, since the apostles said in their time already there was an apostasy. So this is so this argument is the great apostasy argument. It never made much sense to me because if there was this great apostasy, um, who was there to keep uh, the church going, right? And this 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 goes in with the uh, with the response I gave to Garden. Garden asked, "What do you think of the uh, this trail of blood sort of succession?" where the Baptists say that they are the Valdigensians and the, the, these groups of heretics. If you can say that, for example, the Orthodox Church was this great apostate church, but you have to, you have to point out to me that there was a church during that great apostasy. If there was no church during the great apostasy, then you're basically saying that the gates of hell has prevailed against the church. And if you're saying the gates of hell has prevailed against the church, then uh, you just refuted Christianity. You should not be Christian anymore, or you, your argument is just wrong, right? So that's my obje that will be my objection against it. If there is a great apostasy, there there does there is a need for there to be another church, but the ba the people that use the great apostasy argument against Orthodox against against us, they don't really bring up an alternative church because there was no alternative church, right? and as I said, you. This is not like you can't say, oh, you know, you don't need an alternative church. Or we had these group of heretics that were the church. In your view, they're also they're just as uh, there are also apostates. They also believe in a church structure. They have different views of church structure. They also believe in the say they also believe in certain things that you call us apostate over. So the the great apostasy argument doesn't really make sense. And in terms of um, uh, the the apostle saying that there that there was apostasy. The apostles are not saying the church is going to be an apostate. The the apostles say that there are going to be a lot of apostates. And where do we see these apostates in Nicaea? When the Arians uh, taught their erroneous doctrine, you had a mass apostasy uh, from orthodoxy to Arianism, and that's what the first council at Nicaea, yeah, Nicaea dealt with. Ognash says, but only after their uh, plus, oh he's continuing, then they become arrogant all of a sudden, these cowards. Yeah, I think Turks in Germany, perhaps they act like that, perhaps. I, I'm not really fully um, in it with the, with the Turk Germans. I have a lot of relatives that live in Germany and they're very secularist. They're, they're generally good people. They actually, they're actually against um, Turkish people "Quote unquote invading Germany." They're, they they themselves says you live in Germany and you get benefits and then you act this way. Like how dare you? I I recently had like a uh, two of my um uh, one of my relatives come to my house uh, to my summer house and and his husband and they basically talked about this and we talked a lot about Orthodox actually with them and like they were pretty receptive to it. So they like listened to me talk about Christianity and. They didn't instantly like say, "Oh, you know, I'm going to become Orthodox," but they they did seem receptive. They seemed to understand that like Orthodoxy, you know, makes sense, right? And that my faith uh, uh, makes sense, and they they um pretty they're pretty much supportive of it. I even talked about um the debate with Saint Gregory of Palamas and Barlia, and they were talking about deism. They noted that how a lot a lot of people in Germany are deists. So you have atheists, and then you have deists who think who don't think that God revealed himself through scripture. They believe in impersonal deity and such. And I pointed out that uh, the way you can know that there's a deity, if if um, you can't know that there's a deity uh, in a deist universe. That's one of the arguments I made. And in regards to what they taught of Roman Catholicism, I, I talked about how um, uh, 
I mentioned a lot about the argument, not a lot, but things that they could understand, and like we had good conversations. So it wasn't, so it's not something that happened uh, where like a lot of people do this, where they like rant about something, and the people listening are like uh huh, uh huh, uh huh, and they're not listening at all. But they were like, when I was telling to them, it was they were like pretty like asking me questions and such. So there are some cool people, cool Turks in Germany. A lot of them are my relatives, but <laughs> but yeah, Turkish people in Germany are generally pretty wild. Um, Pretty, pretty, pretty different from uh, mainland Turkish people. Did I miss any questions? I think that's all the questions that I covered so far. I mean, this is a this is a good stream. We're nearly hitting two hours, and uh, if there's no questions to be asked. I'll get on to what I wanted to talk about during this downtime. I want to talk about. This is something that um, that really bothers me. And I see this a lot on Twitter. I see this um, sentiment a lot on Twitter, a lot by Orthodox. And the sentiment is about the unification between the Roman Catholics and the Orthodox, or unification between the between the Oriental Orthodox or whatever heretical group, and that like we, we should hope for unification and etc. etc. Et and the first thing I would like to start with in regards to this discussion will be Father Josiah Trenum's argument. He says, let's say that we do unify with the Roman Catholic Church. Then what happens? What happens the next day? Do you think that the Orthodox will go to a Roman Catholic Church and say, wow, you know, this is authentic Christianity? No. Right? So in praxis, there's still a lot of issues in praxis to go over. And that's the point that he was making. But the point I want to make, the, the, the major issue with this line of thinking is that while we are having constant, while we have the fake Orthodox and while we have uncanonical groups, how can you think that we can unify with Roman Catholics? How can you think we can unify with the Oriental Orthodox? We can't even unify with 20 person jurisdictions. How can you unify with millions of people, with jurisdictions where there are millions of people? It's, to me, it sounds so silly. And it's it's naive. It's it's very optimistic, but it's incredibly naive. It's incredibly naive, and people don't like people don't really understand the problem with this. So, for example, in my personal experience, as like last week, I was going to a uh, to to church, and I saw this Turkish Orthodox patriarchate. I walked by. It was close to the church that I was going to. And it's a, it's an in, it's an uncanonical church. It's uh it's independent, so it's not in communion with any of our churches. And I looked at the history, and like there's some wild history. Like the Turkish Orthodox are like the Turkish Orthodox uh, raided the Ecumenical Patriarchate numerous times, and like try to fight with people. Like they're they're crazy. Like initially it was a good plan. Like it was like there was a plan to genuinely build a Turkish Orthodox church. But then it seems like at one point that this Orthodox Church was infiltrated by the nationalists, by the Turkish nationalists, and these Turkish nationalists used uh, used the Turkish Orthodox Church against the Ecumenical Patriarch. Now this happened in 1923, and at the time there was a Freemason Patriarch. So you know it's a good thing, like he deserves it. Uh, screw that guy. But he also introduced a new calendar, so double screw that guy. But uh, they did this later on again, so it was pretty obvious at that point that the Turkish Orthodox Church is web is basically a weapon against the Orthodox Church, and that's why they're uncanonical. So this is that's so uh, the point I'm making. That if you can't solve that issue, if you can't get 20 person jurisdictions into back into the church, how can you get the get the Roman Catholics back into the church? You have to be delusional to think that you can do such a thing, and I don't. I don't like the sentiment at all. I think that sentiment will eventually lead to uh, some form of ecumenism, and I don't. I don't want that. I think we have a lot of differences with the Roman Catholics. Even some people say, "Well, uh, we might not." Have, well, there are some areas where we don't have dogmatic differences, and and such and such. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. Even non-dogmatic differences matter a lot. And it's very hard to unify with them. So we're getting some more questions. Uh, hold on, let me see. Creation cre Creationist says, actually, there is a way to unite by con converting all Catholics to the true faith. There you go. There you go. 
that's that's the way we can unify. I 100% agree. But the problem here is a lot of these pro unification people they don't really think of that. And as a matter of fact, these same people uh, tone police you. They say don't try to convert. Like they don't directly say don't convert people, but they do say um, you should stop engaging in polemics so much. And they don't, as I said, they don't say these things openly, but I read between the lines and that's what I'm reading. And a lot of people uh, with me are also understanding that, you know, these people are saying these things not because they just want to say, but because they don't like us debating Roman Catholics or whatever, which I can't sympathize with that. Organized says, I'm actually thinking about converting to Catholicism. The recordings by Father Ripper on YouTube here impressed me a lot. Father Ripperger is pretty good from what I've heard. I, I know a lot, another, another person that's a, that's a convert to Christianity that's into Father Ripperger. But ultimately, I would say just yeah, converting to Catholicism just by Father Ripperger is just going to make you miserable. It's just going to make you miserable. I mean, for we have Father Josiah Trenham, and I will say he's way better than Father Ripperger. He has a lot of great content. And ultimately, in regards to, I don't know why you want to convert to Roman Catholicism, but I, to me, there's a lot of depart, points of departure with Roman Catholicism. And ultimately, once you're Roman Catholic, you start to have this viewpoint where, oh, you know, this faith has to be correct. But how can I cope with the fact that, that hell has entered the church and reigned over the church? How do I cope with the fact? And... and these people are in a lot of pain. And ultimately, when we're doing apologetics, we're trying to help these people out. That's ultimately why we're doing this. We're helping these people out and stopping them from uh, being in this sorry situation. Herabubu says, good evening. Good evening, my Albanian bro. Love this guy. Alex P says, I like Trent Hume, but after watching a video where he was pacing Jordan Peterson, I taught him a bit naive. Of course, Father Trent Hume is naive in some aspects. But let's think of it this way. A lot of people have problems. I have problems. Jay has problems. Father Josiah has problems. So him being pro-Jordan Peterson or like him praising Jordan Peterson, he praises Protestants as well. His book Rock and Send is an appraisal of Protestantism. But then you read the book and then you listen to what he says. And throughout his interviews, throughout his book, he's criticizing Protestantism. So he appreciates some aspects of Protestantism and he appreciates some aspects of Jordan Peterson but he knows I don't know if he knows the point of departure with Jordan Peterson but he knows the point of departure with Protestantism so I won't you know be cold with him just because of that soulful hold on give me give me give me a minute I'll have to drink water I'm very thirsty Ah, oh, that felt good. I've been talking for two hours, man. Soulful says, <clears throat> What do you think of the proposition that churches not unify but ally together for the sake of Christendom? I am no ecumenist, but I think there is a problem of Christians focusing more on heretical sects than they do divergent religions that actively hate us. I understand the sentiment. I used to have that sentiment, but ultimately you start to realize that this is very difficult to do. And uh, as an example, Legion of Unholy Cuckolds, as I like to call them, it, they started doing this. Like it, they, they started with the way as you're describing. Now they're a fed group, but you're starting to, you're seeing a, a Legion of Unholy Cuckolds being very anti-orthodox. One of their, one of their representatives couldn't stop talking shit about orthodoxy and that's inevitably what happens with these ecumenistic ally groups uh, <clears throat> I do think there, there I do think that there's a there's a important notion with uh, befriending Roman Catholics that have the same goals which is propagating Christendom as allies I I have many Roman Catholic friends I know a lot of Roman Catholic friends uh, back in the US I've known them personally they're great people and we have very respectful conversations. We have the same goals with them. But ultimately, if you're trying to make this an organizational thing, I think you're going to have a lot of problems. And and the thing about focusing on heretical sects is that, first of all, there's two important things. First of all, those people in the heretical sects are going to realize your argumentation. Second of all, those people that are not in that heretical sect, but they don't know anything about the heretical sect, are now going to be immune 
of the propaganda of those heretical sects. So, for example, by making videos against Roman Catholics and by pointing out the mistakes Roman Catholics make as Orthodox Christians, we are inadvertently pretty much uh, helping out a lot of inquirers that consider Roman Catholics and Orthodoxy but don't really know about them both. And we put it, we tell them, this is what they believe, this is what we believe, and this is the point of departure. And it helps out a lot of people. So I, I do understand the sentiment. I, I have the sentiment, but it is very difficult to maintain the sentiment. And I think instead of diverging energy there, I think we can diverge energy in other places. Hera Bubu says that he doesn't trust Father Ripperger. He told his listeners to start meditating. Is this is this like this uh, yoga meditation? Or if it is, then that's okay. But if it's like scriptural meditating, then there's nothing wrong with scriptural like medit. There's an orthodox understanding of meditation, so to say, and that's really just reading the Bible, I, in, in a way. Um, why is real Vatican Catholic so toxic? Says Brandon Ratliff. Why are they so toxic? Because they're an end times cult. That is their, that's their attitude. Uh, because they're an end times cult, they're, they're very ed they're very on edge. Um, they they believe in the papacy, but then they say that the papacy is apostate, and so it creates a lot of difficulty for these people, and uh, they end up in psychologically speaking in such a way where. They have to attack everyone. It, it it just attracts a bunch of edgy people. And if you if you talk with the, the average Vatican Catholic uh, fanboy, they're they're all robots. They're all robots. Vatican Catholic is their daddy. They they go to Twitter. They say you are heretic. Post video of some Vatican Catholic bullshit and just leave it at that so they don't they don't make arguments there they just make they just use talking points that their daddy use yeah, told, tells them to have and ultimately just breeds a bunch of toxic people so that's i i think that's why vatican catholic is just a bunch of scary people and there's a french guy who exposes them and a lot of that stuff is just wild it's wild alex p asks didn't Atatürk consider making turkey a christian nation at one point I know he had advised everything. Said, That's wrong. He didn't consider making Christ Turkey a Christian nation. He was against. He's against religions. He was against dogma. He's anti-Christian. No. Nope. 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 Jason. Uh, Jason Nixon. He loves you, but not me. <laughs> Good conversation. Garden asks, "What are the best examples of hell prevailing over the Roman Catholic Church?" I mean, uh, my friends Nick and Harabubu posted a lot of clown masses. I think. Uh, I think one aspect that people don't re really realize is that post schism Roman Catholic Church, even be way before Vatican II, way before Vatican I, was already hellish. So if you read Occult Renaissance Church of Rome by Michael Hoffman, um, I think it's 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 eye it's, it's an eye opener. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church has been hellish forever. It was always hellish. It was never. <laughs> And of course, the Orthodox Church had a lot of issues. We we attracted a lot of bad problems in our church too. I'm not downplaying that, but come, you know, you had one of the problems was that you had simony in the Orthodox Church, right? In the Roman Catholic Church, you had simony too. But then you have stuff like uh, pornography in the Sistine Chapel. That's hell prevailing over the church, bro. And when I posted, there's there's a, there's an image of one of the priests. <clears throat> Uh, of the Roman Catholic Church at the time having his dick eaten by Satan and the Satan is depicted as a snake if that's not hell prevailing over the Roman Catholic Church I have a very hard time trying to think how what is not here and by the way the Pope at the time completely endorsed it Nick has a, has a great post about it the Pope said my jurisdiction doesn't extend over hell over hell and so he complete so he, for, he used sarcasm he made fun of the person that is depicted as someone that is in hell and i won't even go into the borgia popes i won't even go into the pope john the second who died while uh having being ass fucked he he, he died while being sodomized <laughs> so there's a bunch of brown moments in roman catholic history and Sure, and I like to focus on the dogmatic. I don't like to focus on these things. I mean, you can explain them, you can cope with them, okay? But 
I think norm normatively speaking, there's a lot of problems with uh, Roman Catholic Church and hell prevailing over it. Oh, also the the uh, Margaret Alacoque with the uh, with the with her with her with she with her carving Jesus's name on her breast, and that's where the Sacred Heart tradition really comes from. That's that that's a very different understanding of uh, monasticism and and holiness that we have regarding Roman Catholics. And if you read their lives of the saints, it's it's very different. And yeah, there's a lot of things. Organash says I'm unbaptized, raised atheist. Regarding evil and Catholicism, I think that good always tends to attract the bad. I agree. I agree. But Satanism has a lot of bad. Does that make Satanism good? That will be my objection. So of course, good does tend to attract the bad. But my our argumentation here is that we're not saying that Catholicism attracts a lot of bad. That's not our argu argumentation. A lot of people think that it is. But our argument is, and Michael Hoffman's thesis is that the Roman Catholic Church was always bad. It was always bad. It, and if you look at the history of Jesuits, you start to understand that, wow, you know, there's a lot of bad stuff going on with the Roman Catholic Church. Um, Herabubu says he was talking about it in relation to Buddhism, said some ecumenistic type stuff, but it's years since I listened to that talk. Uh, Father Ripperger says we have the church we deserve. I agree. I mean, here's the thing. Father Ripperger, I myself think that he has a lot of insights. He, has a, he does have a lot of insights. I think that, but does that mean that the church he's in is right? No. So I don't think that we get the church, we have the church we deserve. We get the nation that we deserve. He's completely right. But again, our argumentation is that the Roman Catholic Church was bad from the beginning because of theological issues, because of uh, its structure, a lot of things. So we can go into the theology integrity. There's a lot of things to talk about. And even the uh, uh, church structural, uh, the, the structure of their church. Alex P says, I'm now hearing that some Catholic nun is recommending using robots to replace human priests because of the decreasing number of clergy. <laughs> but, yeah, well, the Catholic nuns are very weird because they will attend these sports events. And like, what are you doing there? <laughs> like, aren't you supposed to be, uh, you know, be a monastic? What are you doing? What are you doing in concerts? Like, I see Catholic nuns in concerts. Like, what are they doing there? And so huge a number. And, uh... It's, it's weird, it's weird. Creation is Do you have your own Discord server? I I might make it one day. Maybe even today, maybe someday. I I might. I'm not really... Uh, but uh, I'm, I might. I'll be, I'll be thinking about it. It would be pretty good to have my own Discord server. I just don't think I'd maintain it well. But uh, soulful. True, there is a Michelangelo painting... Uh, there's a Michelangelo painting of Adam and Eve where Adam and Eve look to the right seeing lit in a tree and Eve is sitting right by Adam's genitals with her head turned over oh yeah there's that one as well well that's kind of like it's kind of like the weak one like you can quote with that but there's a lot of bad stuff there's like there's like a painting in the Sistine Chapel where you can see the father I mean forgive me for for uttering this blasphemy but you can see the ass of the father like you don't see it directly, but you can see the outline. And like, why did you have to? Why did you feel the need to draw that? And this is like in the Sistine Chapel. This is not some some church. This is not some basilica. It's the Sistine Chapel. It's your. It's it's not the Mount Athos of Catholicism, but it's right up there. So the the structure itself is is uh is gone from the start. I will say. Uh, Garden, Nick, and Harry Booba. Look, guys, don't don't fight, don't don't fight. Garden is a cool guy. Nick is a cool guy. Harry Booba is a cool guy. You're all cool guys. Don't you don't need to. You don't need to like. I mean, and I don't think Garden has any issues. I, I'm just saying. I don't, I don't think Garden did anything wrong. I think you know some people spurg out. I spurg out a lot. Everyone spurgs out. Everyone gets angry. There's no need to repeat, like, rem remind that. 
it's it should be well rounded at bridge, I think. Um, anyways, Okanash says, "All right, man, I might look a bit more into orthodoxy. Although being Western Euro, I think it will be hard to find a connection. I don't see why it will be hard to find a connection, though. Like, I mean, in the first millennium, the West was orthodox. I mean, yes, the, there are a lot of different things that the West did even back then." But in terms of, you know, in terms of the truth, we both preach the same truth. So, I think, uh, I, I, I don't remember the biblical event for this, but it reminds me of, um, like, for example, let's say that you're a Gentile at, at the Old Testament period, and you look at the Israelite religion, the true faith, and you say, well, you know, this religion seems cool, but like, um, I'm at home with this pagan religion. I mean, I, I'm not shitting on you, by the way. I completely understand your concern. I completely understand where you are in. It is a legitimate thing, but I will say, um, I, it's about truth, right? It is about truth. It's all about truth, and that is what should be most important. I think you should keep that in mind, and it's going to be hard to put that in your mind but over time you will get used to it i think and yeah i i completely sympathize with you having a hard time with the western euro connection the, the european tradition is very rooted in roman catholics but i will also say it is very rooted in orthodox christianity as well in many regards um uh, Joel says catholics are majority left wing at this point tradcats are a maverick group i agree uh, not at all. I'm Italian and Iberian. I felt right at home going to liturgy for the first time. Like, yeah, you can you can end up being right at home in liturgy. I mean, or liturgy, for example, is not an Eastern liturgy because St. John Chrysostom is a Western saint as well. It's the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom that we have. And the tradition, the iconogra iconographic traditions, the Roman Catholic Church had iconography, they had a tradition of iconography even in the post schism, but now they don't have it anymore. But they do, they did actually used to have it. They even posted some uh, 13th century, 14th century, 15th century icons that the Roman Catholics did, and they they look pretty great. And so they they themselves had iconographic traditions. So uh, there's a lot of things that you can uh, be at home with in regards to orthodoxy. Creationist, creationist. Yeah, theological errors always lead to some sort of moral degradation. I, I agree, yeah. I think theology is at root at uh, how the churches are. I think theology has to do with everything, with how we act, with how we live. It is our worldview, right? And, and if your worldview uh, influences the way you act, you hesitated there. Bro. I'm sorry, bro. I'm sorry, bro. I'm sorry. But you're a cool epic dude. I'm sorry for hesitating. Um, <clears throat> Proud old being JC Denton asks, What missionary missions are there in Turkey currently? Oh, Matthew says hi. Hello, Matthew. Matthew's another great guy from Twitter. Twitter daddy. Not my daddy, though. He has a he has a family. That's what I mean. Oh, what mission missions? Most of them are probably Protestant. I don't think there are any Orthodox missions at, at all. I mean, the thing is, the EP and the, and Turkey has a uh, not a positive relationship. I mean, we're not enemies or anything, but it's it's political. There's a lot of politics going around, so it's very hard to evangelize. So most missionary missions in Turkey will be either Syriac Orthodox, so Oriental Orthodox, or they will be from Protestants. And there's a lot of Protestants in Turkey actually, and there is a a a uh, a Christian book bookstore in Taksim that I went to. I'll check the books out. First of all, other than a book of the life of Saint Polycar, which is translated, they have no books about church fathers, zero books about church fathers, but they have books about Syriac Orthodox church fathers, so post Chalcedonian church fathers for uh, for the for the Oriental Orthodox that is. So I think that from my knowledge that bookstore is probably Syriac Orthodox. So the Syriac Orthodox are trying to evangelize but in terms of orthodox there's really no like the evangelization is very weak i'm not seeing it there uh super roll tiger road trip says i'm a roller american and i felt right at home with orthodoxy doing right side of the cross yeah i mean all of these people 
that talk to you, Agnash, uh, they do raise fair points. They raise very fair points. And as I said, I completely empathize with the situation you're in. It's, it, 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 you're not wrong in, like, it's not your fault that you're in that situation. Alex P says, Florian Geyer and Sven Longshanks have a good series on the Celtic Saints of the UK. Yeah, Florian Geyer is a good dude. I, I recommend him. I recommend that you check him out. I think he's in, I think he is in seminary. So he's not doing podcasts anymore. So I guess I'm filling his place <laughs> if I can. Haribo, Catholic is basically a boomer self-worship cult at this point. A lot of parishes, Catholic parishes are like that, unfortunately. Matthew says, I have been to church in like 15 years and felt at home at my first issue at my Roko church. Yeah. I went to a Russian church just last week and like I felt at home. It was it was a pretty good Russian church too. Um, Thomas are idolaters of things like by Sebastian Lopez. I, I agree because a lot of them... I, I posted a tweet about this. Um, they will say... They will call us Buddhists for navel-gazing. But then they'll say... You know, these uh, the Aristotle and Plato had really good insight. Uh, okay. <laughs> so we are Buddhists, but you are not pagan. Okay, understandable. So there's a lot of emphasis on the intellect. And I'm not saying that intellect is a bad thing. Our emphasis is on intellect and spirit. That's orthodox emphasis. It's the emphasis between this... Uh, spirit and the intellect both are very 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 important I, a lot of saints actually do say that you have to know theology you have to research about theology you have to understand theology and a lot of them do promote the, uh, promote uh, education um uh, i'm not going to rock a church rock a little shows that yeah it is i can be to the data not sexual never ever read dostoevsky what are your plans for your next videos i've never read dostoevsky so i don't i'm not really aware i don't really i haven't really read a lot of literature from that time period uh what are my plans for next videos? i mean right now i don't really have much of an idea but tomorrow when i wake up i might suddenly have a great idea so that's kind of uh the how how I'm uh we might do like social commentary we might go with theology uh we might tackle a heret her heretical group or maybe movie review in the future game review in the future anything can happen so I like to keep my options open open and yeah orthodox is my home but Roker is where I stay at stay in that home that's a very good way of explaining it. Uh, naval gazers, nothing wrong with appreciating one's tummy. This man's right. Catholics idolize the mind and downplay the spirit. I, I think, I agree, but the way they like, they don't really downplay it willingly. Uh, their understanding of the spirit is very contrary to our understanding of spirit. So when you look at uh, Margaret of Alacoque again, um, it's it's like that's not that's not the spirituality of the priest schism church. That's not the spirituality of the priest schism church. When you see lactation, uh, drinking the milk of the Virgin Mary, that's that's not that's not Christianity. That's not priest schism Christianity. Not even coming close to that. So uh, review the Joker movie. I will review the review the Joker movie. Yeah, probably. Being up, up baptized, I feel a connection to God, but none to Jesus Christ. Although I haven't even read the whole Bible yet, admittedly. Uh, that's fair. I mean, I, I, I don't read it. How <laughs> to say it to that. But in terms of the Bible, I mean, a lot of people... Here's one problem I see from people. A lot of people pretend, give this sort of air of confidence as if they read the entire Bible easily. Do you realize... Hold on, let me get my OSB. Let me check. Let me check my Orthodox study Bible. Let's see how many pages this this bad boy has. Okay, so I'm right now in the Old Testament. I'm in Wisdom of Sirach in my current reading. Uh, so there's still a lot of books that I have to go through, but I've gone through 70% of the Old Testament. I read the entire New Testament except for the Book of Revelation. So let's look at this bad boy. How many pages you have? 1,700. 700 pages I think yeah and there's still more information in the Orthodox study Bible so what's the point here uh, 
do you have any book where you have read like 2,000 pages or t even 1,000 pages? Do you, even 500 page, page books for most people seem very hard. So Bible has a bunch of books and a lot of those books sometimes need you to reread it to understand what's going on. So I don't like this air of, uh, of arrogance that some people have pretending as if they read the entire Bible because that's not the, that's not the whole story. Reading the Bible itself is a hard thing to do. But do we, do we don't do it because it's hard? Nope. We keep on doing it. We keep on doing it. We try to read the Bible. Um, if you follow the uh, Bible reading plan in my How to Read the Bible video, if you follow that reading plan, you will finish the entire Bible in a year. That sounds a lot, but you only need to read the Bible uh, 15 minutes, 20 minutes per day. Or if you want, you can be like me and uh, make that 20 minutes, 40 minutes or whatever. So you can read more than the plan tells you to. Oh, review my last game is Mirana. Uh, I, I, I slept and you sent arrow and we killed uh, a lot of heroes. That was That's my review. Review done. <laughs> Catholic, uh, let's see the questions. Hard spot. Why presuppositionalism as opposed to other form of apologetics? What's wrong to evidentialist approach to, to for example, proving the exist existence of God? Well, presuppositionalism, as as I read before, as Father Nuss has said, uh, as I read Father Nuss say in, the, in, in earlier, presuppositionalism is very important because evidentialism misses out on questioning or worldviews, right? So one crucial mistake. Uh, uh, Greg Bonson makes this point very, very, very clear that when we look at certain things, and Jay Dyer obviously makes this point, and Father News makes this point, every every presuppositionist makes this point that when we when we look at things, uh, we don't look at those things neutrally. We have different interpretations, different views of what that thing is, right? So even like something as simple as God. Right? What is God? Well, the Satanist. Well, I'm not gonna go that. Right, but um, for example, uh, the Muslim will say that he believes in a God. We will say we believe in a God. But do we mean the same thing? Nope. We mean we mean radically different things. So our God is radically different. When we're talking about terms, we have radical different understanding of terms. So. The important thing about presuppositionalism is that presuppositionalism is actually uses evidentialist approaches. It does use evidentialism. That's what most people miss out. So just because we're presuppositionalists doesn't mean that we suddenly like you can still use the Kalam argument as a as a presuppositionist. You can still use natural theology in a way, but you have to understand that we, that ultimately you have to. Uh, make a worldview critique, make a worldview, um, un have a have an understanding of your worldview, question others' worldview. And like, for example, Jay have emphasized this, this a lot. The problem with natural theology is that you're looking at the world and you're coming to the conclusion that God exists. Well, the problem with that is that you, do, you, don't, you don't know for certain what the world was like 6,000 years ago, right? So, it, so, and that's actually one of the objections that skeptics use against natural theology proponents. They'll say, well, okay, but how do you know for certain that the world was made in the same way 4,000 uh, years ago? Or like yesterday, how do you know it is the same way? How do you know there is uniformity in this world? And the evidentialist, the natural theologist, has to use presuppositionalism in order to maintain the solidity of his argumentation. That's why we are presup gang. It's not because we say that these approaches are very bad and we never use them. No, we do use them, but we use them in a proper understanding and we use them as uh, those are in our way presuppositions. So that's how I will uh, explain. So, of course, as I said, natural theology, when you look at the nature, there's a lot of things that you can see that, that Christianity teaches. But overall, holistically speaking, you can never come to Christianity by using natural theology. Never, ever, never. 
you have to have that because the doctrine of the fall is revealed. So we start with revelation. We start with uh, what God has revealed to us. And that is our starting point. Whereas the starting point of the natural the theologian is uh, his observations. So natural theology is, is in a way scientific as well because it depends on the observations. Um, I'm reading the book of Daniel right now. I was taught to read the New Testament first as a Catholic kid. And the New Testament is good to read as a first book. But the Old Testament is incredibly important, I think. So yeah, you should read the Old New Testament first. But then you should definitely read the Old Testament. As I mentioned before in the stream, the fathers refer to Old Testament as the scripture. So they hold it in a very high regard. And the New Testament makes no sense without the Old Testament. Organize says it just blew me away how certain passages correspond with the conclusions I came to myself in my own experience out in the world. That's very valid. I same for me. I would, I think same for literally every Christian here. Uh, a lot they there's a lot of wisdom in the Bible. So naturally you're gonna be all shocked. You're gonna realize, wow, you know, this is crazy. This is this is insane. And um, yeah, I had a lot of like big moments. Uh, like epiphanies, basically, when I was reading the Bible. It's as I said, it's a very it, it. The Bible was written by and compiled by incredibly wise men. So naturally, it's going to happen. Did I miss out on a question? Uh, let's start with the Gospels. Jay tweeted a good critique of natural theology. Yeah, I saw the tweet. That's basically what I just said. Like, was pretty much a different way of telling. Uh, Explaining the tweets you made. Thoughts on climate change and the environmentalism propaganda in the media and from the politicians. Now, I'm an environmentalist. You have to be an environmentalist to be a Christian. But are we environmentalists in the same way that the left people are? No. Not at all. So the way we understand with environmentalism, the way we explain orthodox environmentalism is that the environment is our irresponsibility. So because we have to look out for the environment, it is our responsibility. We are the stewards of Earth. All right. So because we are the stewards of Earth, we have to look out for the environment. For the environment. Now, does that mean every time someone tries to do something good for the environment, we go by their side and we support them? No. And the point I'm, I'm wanting to make in regards to the propaganda of environmentalism and climate change is that it's all political. They don't really give a shit about the environment. Do you think Greta Thunberg really cares about the environment? Even if she does, why am I listening to a 15-year-old autistic kid? I'm not going to get my opinions from an autistic kid. I'm going to get my opinions from people that actually make arguments instead of polemics. Dumb, stupid climate change polemics. And the biggest reason why I am i don't look at en modern environmentalism and climate change uh, as, as a good thing is simply because this has been politicized for years now. Uh, we heard that the ice caps will be melting in the year 2000. Uh, yes, thank you, Al Gore. Uh, we still have ice caps today. And then, oh no, they're actually going to be, they're actually going to go away in 2016 oh we still see ice caps now, this has been happening for 60 years and at this point anyone that thinks that the environment uh, uh, the environmentalism like political environmentalism and uh, secular environmentalism is a valid option for christians i have to say you're pretty naive and you have to look at what's go what has happened in 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 the past and I don't believe that the political elite really like care about the environment. They don't give a shit. They don't care. If they really cared, I will. I made this point in one of my articles for Republic Standard. If they really cared, they will try to make um, fossil fuel more efficient. If you make fossil fuel more efficient, you have less uh, <laughs> dirt on Earth. Basically, you have less pollution. So that's one of the aspects you can you can use to help the environment. But of course, these people don't really care about that. Um, 
to Mobo says, I think it depends on what the atheist believes about how the world works and whether they are consistent with those beliefs. And what did he say? But he says, I was trying to explain the same thing about the environment to a cradle orthodox that fell away, but I started to come back around to the church. She's a climate change and vegetarian person. Uh, vegetarianism. I think there... I believe in the Bible there are certain there are certain like Gnostic sects that banned eating meat, straight up banning meat, which uh, basically being a lifetime vegetarian. I mean, you know, like Orthodox in Orthodox you have so many fasts that you might as well not be a vegetarian. I don't, I don't see the point. And you when you're feasting, what are you gonna feast with? You're gonna feast with plants? <laughs> you're gonna feast with plants? Come on. And just because we just because the environment is important doesn't mean that we should not make use of it. The environment is there for us. We're not there for the environment. Um, the limiting children propaganda to fight climate change leads to more abortion, which is unacceptable. I know, but the, but in my view, with the limiting children propaganda, it's so it's so strange because I would say that the way that the population is right now, there's a lot of people and it's really changing the way our economy works all around the world. It's really causing a lot of issues. How do we solve this? But we don't solve this by killing people. We don't solve this by killing people. At all. That's not what we do. But then what do we do? And, you know, I, I do... I do believe we're overpopulated. I don't think that just because we have we are overpopulated means that we have to kill people. That's obviously immoral, but it's it's very interesting how it is because uh, when the industrial revolution hit and people started having have a lot more children, when people shouldn't didn't start dying, and when when the when hosp when hospitals uh, when when we made advancements on medicine. A lot of consequences happen, and I'm not going uh, Ted Kaczynski mode here. I'm not a Kaczynskiite. Uh, I'm not a pine tree gangster, but there is a point to be made that uh, that these technological advancements has changed our life. Uh, in some aspects, they change our life for the better. In a lot of aspects, they change our life to, for the worse. So it's something that's really harsh. It's hard. It's harsh to deal with. Um, but that, that is by no means... So the point I'm making here is that the propaganda is very bad. But a lot of people that do eat this propaganda up, as at times they eat it up for the right reasons. But they have like wrong views. But at times they do legitimate... Like they have legitimate concerns. Concerns. <clears throat> um, I've seen Catholics say that what Orthodox call natural religion is what they call natural theology is the stream. As I mentioned before, you can use natural theology in an orthodox sense. But natural theology that Thomas Aquinas used and the Roman Catholics used, <clears throat> it's not our natural theology. That's really the, the point of departure we have in terms of natural theology. So, no, we start with the scriptures. The Roman Catholic, when he's philosophizing about the world, does not start from the scripture. And that is our... That is where we diverge from the Roman Catholic when it when it comes to theology. And any Thomist, any mega Thomist person, will always use natural theology. The only the only Thomist that I know that tried to use presuppositionism, ironically, was J. Dyer himself, and he was a Thomist like ten years ago. Other than that, and when he tried to push presuppositionism, uh, people during that argument ended up calling him a heretic. <laughs> so. No, so like, no, it's not the same. If it was the same, these people will be receptive to what he was saying at the time, but they weren't receptive at the time. They called him a heretic, and so it, it shows that they're not receptive at all. Um, Organash asks, What do you think about pagans like Varg and Tulian perspective? Is he possessed, or is he just evil? Well, we shouldn't really mix a, a, a saint, oh, I forgot the name of this, but there's a saint that says we should never, I believe saint, I forgot his name, but he says that we should never mistake with the image of God in him and what he has done with his will. I'm paraphrasing here, but um, Varg is not an inherently evil person, but he by will has uh, become very evil. 
And is he possessed? Mm, maybe. I think he might be. I think all evil people are possessed. Because in order to be possessed, you have to will yourself to be possessed. Right? You can't... You can't be a normal person and just be. Oops! Uh, uh, I guess the devil. I guess the demons are controlling me now. Because if that was the case, then what's stopping the demons from possessing all of us, right? So we have to accept the demonic position. And I think Varg at one point in his life accepted the demonic position, and he's going with it. And Varg is just a clown. I mean, he's just. Is this what the devils come up with? Like the argumentation that he comes up with is so stupid. It's such a low IQ argumentation. But you know. Uh, he's misleading a lot of people. Um, I don't like Varg at all. I think he's an idiot. But I do like Varg in the sense that he's driving people from paganism. I had a friend who apostatized. Now he's back into orthodoxy, but he apostatized. And one of the reasons why he didn't become a pagan is because Varg. Because like Varg is just like every pagan is like Varg. I don't want to be a pagan. I don't want to be associated with these people. And he understands the principle of. Uh, of bad fruits, good fruits, and he's he understood that there are no good fruits in paganism. So Timoba says, "Thoughts on palm tree gang? Are they correct?" Well, what does palm tree gang even say? Um, I'm not. I don't really empathize with palm tree gang. I think Ted Kaczynski. I don't think he's a good role model. Uh, I might be I might be killed here. I might say I don't think I don't think it's good to base your political socio political commentary on Ted Kaczynski. Um, I don't think he was like hundred percent correct in literally everything. Or yeah, but in terms of you know, but and I've said all this. Does that mean I'm anti environmentalist? No, I just literally said like at the beginning of exp uh, expanding on my view of environmentalism, I said. In order to be orthodox, you have to be an environmentalist. In, orthodoxy is environmentalist because we're stewards of the earth. But the way we protect the environment and the way we become stewards, there's a difference there. And I think the pine tree gang is too stuck in dialectics. I think they're stuck in the whole like uh, uh, technology is always 100% bad and we should get rid of it. And they don't, I don't think they think the, think of the consequences of getting rid of the technology. I mean, a lot, so many people are dependent on medicine. Is that if you get rid of medicine, then there's no different. You're you're no different than an abortionist. Okay. Now, I I empathize with the sentiment that there are consequences of technology that by that we might want to roll back on, but we have to understand that first of all, this is very difficult. But other other than that, than it being difficult, I will say. It um uh, it might have huge consequences and you might end up just being you know just end up killing people. I mean um uh, I believe Genghis Han was it Genghis Han? Yeah, Genghis Han. Genghis Han killed so many people that he uh he helped out the environment. So should we be like Genghis Han? No, not at all. So. That's basically my view of poetry. I think they like they they need to prioritize their views a lot better. And as I said, I empathize with them. I think they have a lot of good points, but I'm not a pine tree uh, gangster. Uh, so yeah, man, it's been two hours and thirty minutes. The stream's been pretty good. Uh, once we hit three hours, I'll probably stop. I thought this would be like thirty minutes, but it's been going on. A lot and if you have a lot more questions as I said it could be very simple questions I'd be down to answer them uh, I've answered like a bunch of questions so far this is a very efficient Q&A so while we're using this downtime I'd like to talk about another thing oh yeah have any of you guys seen the 1 Peter 5 article uh, about orthodoxy uh, the one Peter five article, which was like basically, uh, don't become orthodox because everything good orthodoxy has, we have. That's the thesis of the of the article, which is very stupid and very idiotic. But then I realized it was written by a woman, so oh, no, nothing surprising here. 
and I didn't even read the article actually. I don't even read these articles uh, because I think they are a waste of time. But from from the understanding of my friends, is that it's kind of incoherent in a way. Um, he said he states that it's he, it, this thesis is that all the good things we have, capitalism has. But then she says, oh, you know, we have a lot of radical points of departure. And it, overall, I think it's a cope. It's 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 cope the article. It's cope the article, and I don't think it's going to convince a lot of people. Mm. From my from the way I sk I skimmed through it, I didn't fully read it, but it talks about divorce, I think, and and other stuff that we have heard constantly, constantly. Uh, so yeah. Timobo asks, I'm planning to start converting to orthodoxy next year because there's a church 100 meters away from uni campus. 100 meters away? You're very lucky. My parents might be against it though because my dad is a prop minister. What do I do? I really, I, my advice, and this might be a radical advice, uh, just go. Don't listen to your parents. Just go. If I, like, Christ makes it very clear, I think, very, very clear that he is the number one priority in our lives. He makes it very clear. God is the number one priority. The Father is the number one priority. So, your parents want to stop you from going to church? Well, you, you have to say, sorry, but uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just wake up at 7 a.m. and I'm going to go to church. And there's nothing you can do about it. And... If you can't do it, if you if you're worried about the rifts that it's gonna cause, and if you want to, uh, you know, if you think that you should wait for the right time and and see if they're convinced by that, that's fair. Okay, I can understand that. I can understand. My personal advice, however, I think just go. <laughs> I I I'm I because from my personal experience with my own parents, um, they usually tell me to not do things, but then I say, uh, whatever, I'll do it anyway. And at and at a point, they just respect it. Anyway, so um, for my experience, so I think your dad might be very against it, but over time, if he understands that you're very uh, stubborn about it, he will. I think in a way he will respect you. He will respect you as a person by doing that. He will start to say, "Wow, like I told this kid to not do something, but he's doing this." So I guess I guess he's a I guess he's a real man now, and maybe even be proud of you, right? So I would say just go and see what happens. And but if you if if you feel like you can't go anymore, if you feel like there's a lot of pressure on you, I, I won't put it against you. I'm, I'm not going to put it against you. I can understand that. I can understand that. Um, you know, you're not even baptized. How can you be a martyr, right? It's Martyrdom is not for everyone. Like, even martyrdom is not for everyone. Agnash says, Interesting. Ripperger talks a lot about demons, a concept so foreign, hard to grasp, or, you know, but yeah, he's an exorcist, right? Um, that's what he talks a lot about exorcism uh, to my understanding uh, my catholic friend implied, Joel says my catholic friend implied recently that hell isn't real and all people are redeemed in purgatory how do I debunk this without being rude well this is universalism this is some this is some crazy form of universalism some different catholic form of universalism and I will say Use the scriptures and just say that uh, when Christ says that you're going to be condemned, they, Matthew 15, 26. Matthew 15, 26, the parable of the sheep and the goats. What's the point of that parable? What, what the heck is the point of that parable? And also, the purg purgatory, purgatory is not real. Now, there's an aspect of purgation. A lot of fathers part part talking about purgation. Is there a third plane where, the, where it's purgatory? And do you like stay in purgatory for 200 years and you just you just sit there in purgatory and be purged by your sins? No. That's not that's not patristic teaching. That's a post schism teaching. So both purgatory and universalism themselves are completely, completely, completely wrong. I mean, ask your ask your friend this. Picture the most anti-Christian, the most disgusting person in your mind. And picture that person and then think, do you think that person will enjoy heaven? Or will that person think that heaven is like hell? 
So even this universalist view is had like even hell even in the universalist view there is hell. That is the point. And I will say while hell is a real place, that there is also that aspect where uh, very uh, where if you put these people in heaven, they will still be in hell. <laughs> So nothing changed. They send themselves to hell, which is very unfortunate. I I hope and I hope none of us end up doing that them, that to ourselves. But you have to stay vigilant and uh, pray for it. I don't want to spot. Uh, I don't want to pretend as if like I don't want to do this like pietist thing. But like you know, we should be very careful about it. Like look out for yourself, boys. Um. Jatonic asks, "Who is your favorite apostle?" Ooh, this is a this is a hard question. Uh, I really like Saint Paul. I really like Saint John as well. Um, I don't know, man. I think Saint Thomas also kind of hit hit a chord with me. I think I think Saint John. I think Saint John is my favorite apostle because uh, when you read his writings, there's so much knowledge and so much. Uh, I can't describe it. It's it's hard to describe. How can you describe the writings of a of an apostle? You you literally can't. It, it's very hard to describe it. And I and I think Saint John was a very holy person. I think he he was a special kind of a holy person because throughout his life he was always consistently faithful to God, consistently faithful to Christianity and as and and also he uh, well he had an he was an academic. He taught people oops he taught people um, theology. He taught people theology. His gospels are theological. By the way, Saint John has two gospels. It's not just the book of Revelation is also, in a way, the fifth gospels, and 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 to my understanding, there are actually fathers that refer to it as the fifth gospel, and they won't be too far away from the church from the from the truth. So in Bible, we have two of the gospels are written by Saint John. So he, he is a very instrumental apostle, and I will say he's my favorite apostle. I think I wish I will be like Saint John, like I will even come close to the toenail of being like Saint Saint John, and. Um. Yeah, and yeah, like he's my favorite apostle. I think Saint Paul is a very close second. He's Saint Paul is great. He's amazing. Simova says, "Thing is, right? I'll be going to a university away from home, but it's only one hour away, so I'll be home once a week, depending on schedule. So I'm thinking about negatively my church attendance. Well, I mean, still go when you can. You don't only have to go to sun go on Sundays. You can go on." Uh, Vespers, Vespers are valuable. You can go on Vespers. Certain dates you might have Saturday liturgies. So you need, so you can go to the church and then ask the priest the the schedule, or maybe they have a website, and you can use that to your advantage. So you don't like going to. You will be missing out if you don't go to Sunday liturgy, but. You can also go to Vespers. You can go to also go to any other time. So you still have a good chance. You still you can still attend ch attend church whenever you can if you're away at university if you're away from home. Theo says you're gay and I don't like you. Yeah, I don't like me either. We have so much in common. Theo. Benjamin Angrignon says, "Are you optimistic about the future for Orthodoxy in the first twenty first century? I have a lot of optimism for American Orthodoxy." Uh, there's a lot of good things going on, and I think uh, I think in terms of orthodoxy, there's a lot of. I mean, if you look at the internet, if you look online, there's a lot of new people coming to orthodoxy, and that can only that can only be a good thing. Now, of course, some of them go through cage stage. There's some bumps around, along the way, but American orthodoxy is giving me a lot of hope because I think there's going to be a lot more academic. Uh, thinking, right? I mean, if, I mean, the reason Orthodoxy has taken this authentic Orthodox has taken to this taken this great form is because of a bunch of people in California, like Father Seraphim Rose and many other people, uh, 
So those people have been inspirations from American Orthodoxy. For nations like Russia, they are definitely on the uh, on a positive road, but there is a lot of work to be done because Russia, Russian people are still very not orthodox at all. So I I have I look at future of orthodoxy in a positive light. I think we're going a good way. We just need to handle these for the might faggots, and we'll be golden, I think. And of course, the David Baldheadites, the uh, the Bulgakovites. And the crypto Marcionites. There's a lot of things works to be done, but I think we're, we're doing a we're doing a good job. Um, let's see. Uh, no, 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 no. What about Western Christianity? I'm pessimistic. I am very pessimistic about. Are you talking about Roman Catholicism, Protestantism? Like they're definitely those those uh, Roman Catholics and Protestants are definitely are going to. It's it's in a plane crash. It's gonna crash. First of all, Father Jos Josiah Trenham states that uh, ninety five percent. There's a ninety five percent decrease um, in Roman Catholic vocations. If you don't have vocations, how can you have people maintaining your faith? You can't. So ca Roman Catholicism is still out there. It's still out there, but. People don't want to go to seminary. People don't want to uh, become proper intellectual Roman Catholics for a good reason. Because most of those places, most of those seminaries have homosexuals. And they rape children. Sometimes they rape the seminarians. And I'm not even making this up. A lot of people that go to these seminaries, they themselves say so. And a lot of people in the seminaries, you ask them about your se their sexuality and they're like, ah ha ha ha, mm, you know, I, I might be straight, but um, then they're, they're definitely gay. They're, there's a lot of gay people in there. So people don't want to go to vocation in Roman Catholic sim. And I will say that is really the, uh, the status of how bad they're going. Now, in terms of Protestantism, a lot of Protestantism is becoming a joke. Baptists are becoming a joke. Lutherans are becoming a joke. Heck, Anglicans are becoming mega jokes. So many of these people are becoming jokes. Is and um, Christianity overall is in a downward trend. But if you statistically look in terms of amount of people that are converted to Christianity, Christianity is like number one over the last century. <clears throat> so we're on a we're on a good road, lads, and and. This is thanks to this is 100 thanks to the information age. I mean, if I if I lived in the Ottoman period, what know about orthodoxy? Probably not that much. <laughs> um, then uh, regarding your still picture, you mean the 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 this image in the stream? Peter Helen has two videos about how early church fathers banned theater and considered actors the lowest of the low. Well, because actors were prostitutes. A lot of uh, prostitution was pretty much synonymous, like actor was synonymous with prostitution. So of course they're going to consider them lowest of the low because actors are, because those actors were nearly all prostitutes. So it won't be surprising <laughs> that they did such. I don't even know who Peter Pete Helland is. Uh, I didn't even really realize you started. Oh, I did post on Twitter. I'm Atlas from Twitter, by the way. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Atlas, good boy, good guy, great guy. Orthodox is rising, though, brothers. Yep, it is rising. We're on a good path. Oh. Where do you think all this homosexuality and Roman Catholicism came from? Ooh. I don't know. I can't really. I'm thinking about it. I can't really pinpoint. I mean, is it something regarding their theology? I think clerical celibacy might have something to do with it. I think it does have something to do with it because uh, it. A lot of people want to become priests, but when it comes to remaining celibate, they're not fit for it. They're fit for being priests, but they're not fit for being celibate. 
A lot of these people have become priests, and what happened? Well, uh, they get sexually frustrated, and some of them end up being homosexual. So I think that might be one of the aspects, but... Um, and, you know, clerical celibacy is not a bad thing. I mean, there was clerical celibacy in certain areas of the church. In the Western church, there was... I mean, the, the in, in uh, Denzinger, the clerical celibacy dogma comes from the Council of Carthage. So some areas did enforce clerical celibacy, but... Especially in Council of Trullo, which unlike some pe what some people says, is dogmatic, is 100% dogmatic in the priest schism church. Even Orthodox think that it is not dogmatic, but it is dogmatic in the Seventh Ecumenical Council. And it says that clerical celibacy is not needed anymore. So the debate is over regarding clerical celibacy. Joel says, Protestants and Catholics make fun of abortion rates in Eastern Europe without acknowledging the USSR barely fell in 91. 75% of evangelicals are Aryan, 75% of Catholics don't even believe in real... I think 50% of Catholics don't believe in real presence. And uh, the abortion rates in Russia is pretty bad, but the abortion, ration, abortion rates in Western European Catholic nations, did they check them out? Those are also pretty bad. So if you exclude Russia... Uh, if you especially compared to Balkans, it's not that we're not that bad. <laughs> not that bad compared to them. Organized says I always had an aversion towards Hollywood and considering how in modern society actors are seen as the biggest idols, it makes to me the op to me that the opposite is actually the case. Opposite are actually the case of what? I I missed that. Anglicanism, crazy golf in the cathedral. Bro, Anglicanism where the head of your church is a woman. Did you guys know that? The head of the Anglican church is the queen. Why is the head of your church a woman? Maybe your head of the church should read one the St. Paul's first epistle to Timothy in second chapter, verse 12. Maybe, maybe she should read that. What's your take on non-denominational churches? The same as I view Protestant churches. They're Protestant. They adhere to the five solas. Uh, they just want to be special, but they're not special. So, pretty much the same way I view Protestantism. Just empty libraries. They're, they're empty libraries. They're Christianity, but they're empty Christianity. Creation is creation. I'm from Russia. There are lots of believers. Uh, uh, those of those who join the Eucharist at least once in a month are 1-3%, but overall you can say there are more like 20-27% of more or less active Christians. So 20-27% of active Christians in Russia, that's pretty decent, because if you look at Western Christian countries, I mean, look at, look at France, how many of them are Christians? They don't even go to the cathedral that burned. Uh... Benjamin and Grignon. The, the Weinstein class, uh, scandal reveals actors still are the way they are. And I mean, the Weinstein scandal is pretty crazy, but I think, you know, actors have always been pretty scumbaggy. Tomobo says, Funny how Catholics think that Vatican II wasn't that bad, but see how bad vocations post Vatican II and still don't understand why Lefebvre did what he did. Vatican II, it was a pretty huge blow for Catholicism, but before, but as Michael Hoffman notes in his book, Occult Renaissance Church of Rome, the whole church is Vatican II. <laughs> uh, Cobra, read! Welcome, read Cringing Cope Friday. This is a Cringing Cope Friday. Are you Turkish or Balkan? I forgot. I am ethnically Balkan. Uh, I have Turkish citizenship. I'm not even, I'm ethnically half Balkan, Georgians are not Balkans. Uh, I'm half Pontic Greek, half Laz. And Lazes are Georgians. Stefan says, convert all Turks. Uh, maybe one day, maybe one day, maybe one day we'll, we'll achieve that goal. Benjamin says, I meant that actors are still prostitutes. Yeah, they mostly likely are. I mean, have you seen movies? They did a lot with a lot of sex. Now the, the actors don't have sex, but uh, they do engage in that in those movies. If you understand the point I'm trying to make here. So the movies, 
Uh, yeah, actors. I mean, there there are good movies. Joker is gonna be a good movie. <laughs> Shut off the bat. But in terms of most movies, most actors, a lot of problems with them. So uh, I can sympathize with the church fathers with saying that being an actor is the lowest of the low thing that you can do. And in a way, actors are still playing prostitution. Yeah. Uh, how did you learn English and how many languages do you know? I know five languages. I learned English going to a Norwegian school. Uh, 90 plus 90 percent, more than 90 percent of Norwegians know English. So it's pretty natural that I learned English as well. If I didn't, then I, I'd pretty much be a mental retard. Um, and I, I know Norwegian, Swedish, Turkish, English. I was learned German, but German, mm, I can't, I can understand German, uh, but I can't speak German. And I spoke Norwegian and Swedish as my natural languages, but I forgot them. So now, while I do actually, uh, I can speak in Norwegian, uh, there's a lot of things that I've forgotten. So generally, right now, the, the languages I'm fluent in is just Turkish and English. Pretty sad, actually. <laughs> Uh, were you raised orthodox nope my family is muslim nominal muslim we don't go to, we don't go to mosque my dad hates religion uh my mom is my mom believes in god but uh she's normie uh so yeah is it actress or actresses that are prostitutes both both are cobra why do you write cringe and cope on every video who are you who are you indeed Maybe someone that I know. Uh, so yeah, I guess I that covers Nancy's video of the two tokens tomorrow in the old calendar, right? Yeah, that's true. That's I'm actually going to church tomorrow for that. Uh, the the Russian church I go to is naturally it's old old calendar. Uh, Send the old calendar. I don't, I don't want to mix my. I'm I'm very bad with the days. I'm very very bad with the days. I should probably pay a lot more attention. The feast days and everything. The calendar is very important, guys. So you better you better um, you better try to understand. There's a lot of good apps uh, about that. Okay, yeah. So it's uh, tomorrow in the in the in the old calendar. Man, I, I wish we had a unified calendar. Like, this whole old calendar, new calendar stuff, I really hate it. And people think that I'm, like, pro-new calendar because I made a video against the fake orthodox. No, I'm just as anti-new calendar as they are, actually. I just think that my salvation is not dependent on the calendar. But, the calendar is pretty important. Uh, orthodox info is some really good... I was going to the subject. Yeah, there's a lot of, like... Fake Orthodox article on Orthodox Info, but the site itself is Orthodox now. They are canonical. So, which is pretty good. How does scholasticism lead to the environment? environment if you know. Well, the scholasticism, the Western understanding of scholasticism. Now, scholasticism is not bad. What does scholasticism mean? It means really just education in theology. That's not bad. But the way the Roman Catholic Church tried to understand uh, theology is that they depended too much on outside sources and even today you can see this so for example roman catholics we re refer to origin a condemned heretic a church father tertullian a church father but these are heretics right so they rely on outside sources uh, they relied on pagans like aristotle thomas relied on Ar aristotle a lot he relied on the church fathers sure but he also re relied on aristotle a lot and now while <clears throat> now here's the thing Here's the point of departure with our reliance. We have Eastern saints, St. John of Damascus uh, and the like. They also rely on Aristotle. But the way they rely on Aristotle is that they already have a set view that is dogmatic. And they use Aristotle to support that view. Whereas in Roman Catholicism, they don't have that set view because they rejected that view in 1054. Right, so because they rejected the those views in 1054 and abandoned a lot of those views, 
they didn't have that uh, that skeleton and because they didn't have that skeleton they relied on pagan philosophy and that's why that's how scholasticism western scholasticism damaged roman catholicism it's not because it's scholasticism per se it's because they abandoned and they based their theology on pagan philosophy which is very ironic because nearly all of the tradcasts i know uh they're very anti-pagan and when the pagans say that well how are you anti-pagan when so much of your religion is based in paganism when they say that they're not wrong they're not wrong they're 100 percent correct against the roman catholics we use now because we use terminology that pagans used to use does that mean we, we rely on paganism no uh they we like this is this is on par of the stupidity some people use this opportunity but this is on part stupidity by saying like uh you use the same language pagans used nice i speak turkish i when i when i preach orthodoxy i use turkish language so does that mean orthodoxy is not islamic of course it's islamic right that's what smart people that's how smart people think like not uh, orthodox like me uh, how did you become orthodox in a muslim country for me it was the internet for me it was the internet as well uh, i knew a lot of orthodox people on discord and uh and because i i knew a lot of people on discord some of them i'm still friends with some other i'm not friends with still but a lot they had a very good influence on me they they uh we aligned when it comes to politics so when they talked about orthodoxy i was receptive to what they say what they said and i ended up making my own research i ended up making my own investigation and it, this was all through the internet so no one i knew personally helped me out with that i have a family member that's Syriac orthodox i didn't even know he was orthodox until my family told him and my family told him told me uh told me about them i didn't even know they were christian maybe you could have talked about christianity to me <laughs> but no i ended up having to do that all along on the internet which is fine it's good that I'm not Syriac Orthodox. <laughs> so, uh, three hours, and I'm getting pretty, pretty tired, boys. Not gonna lie. And I'll I'll take the couple other questions, and uh, after five minutes, I'll probably end the stream. Then I'll have some things to say, I suppose. Timobo asks, do you watch football or any other sport? Also, what are your thoughts on the sportsball meme? The sportsball meme is very 100% accurate. A lot of people that watch sportsball are um, mind control. It's bread and circus. It's used as entertainment. And I say this as someone who watches football. I have two favorite football teams, Fenerbahce and Rosenborg. Uh, I like Rosenborg because I was born in Trondheim. And Rosenborg is Trondheim's team, so I naturally support my city's team. And I support Fenerbahce because that's my father's team. So, I I, I like watching football. I, I really like watching sports. But ultimately, people that get very heated in sports ball, uh, the problem is that, the, here's the thing. People that are very adamant on sports ball generally become anti-nationalistic or anti-tradition because they replace that with sports teams they replace they see the way that the world is and they get angry and how do they use that anger well let's uh let's get mad at people that uh run at the ball for like nearly 90 minutes and that's how sports ball i think is weaponized that's how bread and circus is utilized in the modern world throughout sports ball so I do believe in the sports ball meme, but as I said, I watch sports ball, so I'm a hypocrite. But I guess I'm not a, really a hypocrite because I I don't get really fully, uh, I don't go hardcore about it. I don't base my whole life on it. But there's a lot of people that base their whole life. Come to Besiktas. Besiktas. <laughs> Dude, there's a man. Besiktas. Uh, it's funny. Fenerbahce is, is based on Kadıköy. And do you know what Kadıköy means? Kalkadan. That's where, that's where the Fourth Ecumenical Council happened, boys. So uh, I'm supporting the uh, Chalcedonian team. <laughs> imagine, imagine being Syriac Orthodox 
and hating Fenerbahce because it's the Caledonian team. And that's about to Fenerbahce for being a Caledonian team. That like that could happen if Turkey was Christian. If Turkey was a Christian nation. Uh, check out the scientific examination of the Orthodox Church calendar. Uh, I'll check it out. But from my understanding, my, my, my problem with the calendar is that I want to unify calendar. That's my issue. It's it's a tragedy that there are multiple churches that celebrate feast days in a different day that, compared to other churches. And the situation in Finland, that's that's horrible. Uh, their Pascalian is even changed, which is anathema, which you shouldn't do. <clears throat> are you doing another stream when you hit uh, thousand? Uh, I'm a little upset. I missed you. I mean. It's bad, but the the stream is going to be uploaded on YouTube, so you can check it out. It's no big deal. Uh, thoughts on Bartholomew? Oh wait, are you doing another stream? And you hit. Mm, am I doing another stream? Maybe, yeah. I I might, I might do another stream. Uh, I might do a face reveal. Ah ha ha ha. Uh, I might do another stream for another occasion. I mean, this stream was pretty well made. Uh. I think well received as well. Even now, three hours later, still got 20 views. So people are interested in hearing what I have to say. Uh, so that's pretty good. I mean, if all these people that are watching my stream were in the same room with me, you will be like, wow, you know, that's crazy. <laughs> I mean, professors get those amount of people in their classes. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to brag. I'm not trying to bag. I'm just highlighting on like how wild this is when you think of it in real terms but yeah the stream is going to be uploaded on youtube no worries like when the stream ends it's going to be on youtube i think hopefully uh thoughts on bartholomew i don't like him simple as i a lot of bad things that he's done but i'm not really going to criticize uh the patriarch i'm under but as i said I'm, I'm more like I'm not gonna talk shit to the patriarch I'm under, but I don't like the things he's doing, and the 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 issue here, especially since I live in Constantinople, unless the Bulgarian church, which I plan to go to on this Sunday, unless that's connected to the Bulgarian patriarchate, then all the churches here are connected to the EP. So I might as well go to the EP church, and seeing that the things that EP has done is not nice, but. Does the EP have grace? Well, if I said no to that question, then I will be a fake orthodox. Simple as that. Um, I know Bulgarian churches are not EP, uh, but I, like, I'm like i asking where the Bulgarian church in here. Probably they're under the Bulgarian patriarch, but I'll see like how the parish itself is. So, uh, hello, by the way, Dimitar Storlov. Uh... So I will check out the Bulgarian church this Sunday. Uh, we'll see. I've heard some reports. Actually, so, so oh, Sar, nice, Sar, nice. So I'll see because from what I've heard regarding that Bulgarian church is that well, some people have said that they only do services on feast days, which was pretty strange. So they don't do liturgy on Sundays. But then some other people say they do liturgy on Sundays. And they have a 2010 calendar where they have liturgy every Sunday. So I don't really know. I, I We'll see. We'll see on Sunday. But I'll go to the Russian church, which is also under EP, because it's based on a monastery. And because that monastery... And monastery is based on... Um, it's on, it's it's based on an Atonite monastery. And Atonite monasteries are on, all under EP. So here you go. Russian church based on EP, like, oh, it happens because they're connected to the monastery. So they're more like under the monastery. They're an offshoot of that monastery church. And I do have some issues with that church. I love the church. But everyone there speaks Russian, which is not a problem. But the priest doesn't know Turkish. So how am I going to do confession? Uh, I'm going to have to clear that stuff out. Maybe I can do like some like dual parish thingy where I can go to church I can go to the EP church, do confessions. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know. We'll see. It's because I I really like that church. I like the liturgy. Um, I really like that church. But I also want to be able to you know do confessions. 
So you know maybe we can we can solve these things out. That's why I'm going there tomorrow. One of the reasons why I'm going there tomorrow, of course, it is to also celebrate the nativity. I wasn't able to celebrate it because I was still in Adapazarı, which has an Orthodox church, but it does have a black Protestant church, which is very bizarre. Uh, sometimes there's not enough people attending for all the services. Yeah. Yeah, 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 get a blessing. Yeah, the thing is, as I said, the priest, the only priest there, the priest monk, he doesn't know Turkish, so I need the translation. Uh, someone that can help me with translation. That's why I'm going to go on Saturday. I'm planning on go to go to. Uh, well, I'm planning to go to the nativity uh, liturgy on Saturday and talk with them on it, talk with the Russians on it, and see what we can do about it. If if there's nothing I can do about it, then that sucks. So the, will I frequent the Russian or the Bulgarian church? We'll see on the Bulgarian church. Uh, for me, if they can speak Turkish and if they actually care about the people that go there, some churches in Turkey don't really give a shit if you go to their church. Um, if they care about the parishioners, then I'll probably frequent the Bulgarian church. But if the worst case scenario, I will go to an EP church. Like that's my last resort basically. Uh, which is pretty like which is pretty bizarre to say like the patriarchal church is your last resort unfortunately sometimes that's what's gonna happen but I really really don't like the things that EP is doing and that's all I'm gonna say regarding it oh I asked them for English they didn't know English either uh, I hope the Bulgarian church knows English that will make it easier for me. Aren't churches in Turkey still state owned? No, none of them are state owned actually. Um, they're not state owned. I mean, EP is kind of state owned, but not really directly state owned. Uh, not directly state owned. EP is EP owned. Yep. And that's the problem. <laughs> but if I, I mean, the crazy thing about the EP and me is that if I learn Greek and if I want to be a bishop, I have a very good chance of being a patriarch. But as I said, we'll see what goes on. I mean, because it's I have a good chance of being a patriarch because how many people live, have a Turkish citizenship and are Orthodox and go to an Orthodox church? Not many. Not many people do that. And I will have a good shot. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm even a good contender. But as I said, we'll see what goes on. As of yet, it's way too early to think of these things. So I'm not really going to ponder on them. But I do acknowledge them as something that can happen. So as I said, we'll see. We'll see. Medvite for Patriarch 2040, hopefully, hopefully, well, maybe one day, but um, as the fathers say, the road to hell is paid with the skulls of bishops, meaning that it's a very hard job, and it's, it's, it's an incredibly hard job, and St. John Chrysostom himself notes that, that bishops have it the hardest, he didn't even want to be a bishop, he hated, he hated, it. He hated being a bishop. Yeah, it's good to hear it's a cozy stream. Um, not too much theology, more like we, we covered a lot of things in this stream and covered theology, we covered Turkish politics, we covered. Oh, those were the two things that we mainly covered, I think, theology and Turkish politics. And yeah. And I'm gonna be real with you, boys. I don't really have anything left to talk about. And I don't really have more questions left so after the question from Ikaria Joel after answering that question I'll probably end the stream uh, it was pretty good it was a pretty good stream are most people that go to the churches Turkish nope the Russian church I go to is full Russian I maybe there are certain Turkish people maybe their husbands because the church is 95% woman 95% female, which is like very strange to me, but uh, you know, at least those women go to church, so that's it's a nice thing to see. 
So I haven't seen any Turkish Orthodox Christian, like not Turkish, like uncanonical Orthodox, but like Turkish Orthodox in a canonical church. And I don't really blame them for it. I don't really blame a Turkish person that wants to be an Orthodox that goes to a Turkish Orthodox church. I don't blame them for it. And um, yeah, so having answered that, uh, it was a great stream. It was an amazing stream. We had a lot of views. We had consistently something between 20 and 30 viewers. Uh, already 24 likes as it appears here so it was it was a great stream I mean I might do more of these I might do more of these when I get thousand subscribers or I might do more of these free talk Q&A kind of interactive stream more in the future it was an amazing stream thank you all for tuning in uh, thank you all for still tuning in now and all I have to say is God bless all of you have a great Great, have a great day, great morning, great evening, great night, where the heck you live, and go to church tomorrow, and go to church on Sunday. God bless all of you.